Welcome to the second episode of the VUCA Insights Podcast, where we bring you lessons on investing, entrepreneurship, and growth mindset. Our guest today is Leonid, who is a global commodities investor in the commodities and companies involved in oil, precious metal, and even palm oil and oil seeds. In this particular episode, we start by understanding his experience as an equity analyst to being a portfolio manager before going deep into the oil and gas industry. There, we talked about players within the industry, especially those behind the scenes that trade it as a commodity. And we finally end by looking at the possibility of elevated oil and gas prices in the future. Please enjoy my conversation with Leonid. Hello and welcome to the VUCA podcast episode number two. And today, uh, we have a very special guest. You know, All my guests are very special, but this one is really special because he's a Russian uh, living in London. and um, you can ask him after the show when you con uh, when you come in touch with his page whether he's an is a KGB agent or not. <laughs> but <laughs> he probably works for the mm. SAS right now. But anyway, mm. <laughs> so Leonid, thank you so much and welcome to the show. John, my pleasure. Thank you for the invite. I uh, yeah. really appreciate. It. Uh, love love to tap your thoughts, uh, Leonid. Um, for those who may not know him. Uh, he's actually an equity analyst and very much into the commodity space. Uh, but as we go along and I ask him questions, you will know where his uh, specialty really is. And this is probably not going to be the last because uh, commodity is so wide and Leonid is so experienced in other uh, commodities as well. So I'm going to start out with a very simple question. What was a uh, 15-year-old Leonid like? You know. <clears throat> Well, I was living in a boarding school at the time, um, and I was uh, very focused on the world of um, finance. I was actually quite uh, um, quite keen. <clears throat> I read uh, a book about Charles Yerkes, an American entrepreneur, um, who was quite famous in London for having come here and revolutionized uh, public transport here, right? Mm -hmm. he came from Chicago, and he built out, uh, well, he reunited a bunch of independent lines into a network, right? So he's quite a famous uh, person here and used to be quite well known uh, in America. So I read the book about him, but the, the most interesting part about it, about him was the uh, manipulation on the stock market, right? I mean, he, that's how he made most of his money and lost, lost most of his money too. Um, and that just fascinated me to no end, right? And then I started following it. Um, I started watching uh, CNBC um, sort of on the on, on, on basis and um, reading the FT, that sort of thing, right? And uh, by age 15, I was dead set on uh, becoming a finance guy, right? I didn't know what or where or how, but the whole world fascinated me, right? And I was very interested. And uh, um, I did uh, <clears throat> politics and economics uh, at school. Mm -hmm. um, I was quite uh, and math and uh, and, and math, so I was quite well prepared, and I wanted to do finance at university, so I chose financial economics, and I was, I was really excited. I was really looking forward to all of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what was there prior to boarding school? I mean, what sparked your interest? Was it just peers, or was it a role model that you had, either your parents or either a relative that you know got you that that first spark into finance, or you just you just stumbled well, upon it? Well, don't forget that um, I uh, was born in the Soviet Union and we didn't have finance going up. Really. Of course, mm -hmm. we did. Kind of not really spoken about. Or uh, mm -hmm. um, so uh, my uh, grandfather was a very senior official within the party at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he ended up founding as a Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs, which is a a big, um, it's like the um, the industry spokesbody, right? I mean, it's I the uh, like a chamber the, of commerce or something, is it? Kind of chamber of commerce meets uh, the sort of confederation of British industry. The uh, you know, like it's a very broad uh, umbrella organization for. That it was first a venue for the transition, right, for the Soviet enterprises to become sort of market-driven enterprises, and then it was also a uh, gathering point for all the oligarchs when it became relevant, right? So, um, and again, it was a very interesting vantage point to observe how um, how uh, you know the economy changes and develops, and listen to the stories of all these guys and how they did stuff. 
And Maganda, before then, he was um, an economic aide to two general secretaries of uh, the party and uh, also the head of the economic uh, division within the last Soviet government of Russia, right, Mm -hmm. Uh, in uh, late 91. So, uh, you know, I was obviously a little bit young to really kind of absorb a lot from that, but uh, I always felt like the stories about the time really kind of uh, made me think and wonder, right? Because my uh, granddad was a big fan that China has done their transition and mm. he was, uh, lambasting the government in Moscow for being way, too, g- getting way too ahead of itself on uh, a lot of the policies, right? And uh, uh, it was always interesting to me because they being, uh, you know, there for all these conversations from a very young age, but also um, just observing it, right? And thinking, well, what is the better way, right? I mean, mm, uh, mm. what is the capitalist system comparatively to the social? Yeah. Correct. But what yeah. makes a difference? Why is this bad and why is this good? And could it have been done differently? Because again, like growing up, not growing up, but uh, spending some time in uh, Russia of the early 90s was a very surreal experience, right? So, for example, money, right? Like just coinage and notes, it would change every month or so because the inflation was so rampant, right? That you had to issue new, new notes and then coins became completely irrelevant. Um, and it's just bizarre, right? And every month you fully expect, well, what kind of money will they come up with this month, right? That's what they're saying, right? Um, and then, you know, functions of money. Um, when you're used to that, your local currency isn't, does not have the savings function, right? It's not mm. the store of money you find. It's mm. just there on transactions and mm. even that becomes sort of a bit loose because people go into for foreign currency almost immediately because it's just so much easier to transact in say cash dollars than it was mm. in because of, the, yeah, yeah. because of the uncertainty of the ruble rate yeah and uh, uh, again you, you look at it and you go wow this is really weird and then you come to England and you know the prices haven't changed in a long time the pound is still a pound and you're like huh I wonder why and uh, because at the same time, whilst all of this is happening, the quality of life in Russia has been improving, right? So mm-hmm. you look at it, life is getting better, and yet it's such a mess. And, uh, you know, you go to some other places and it doesn't seem to be changing quite as quickly. And, and again, but at the same time, it's much more stable. How is this uh, possible? And like things like that, I mean, you don't think of it immediately at the time, but reflecting on it, right? I mean, it, it's clearly... Uh, a very interesting background for anyone interested in economics and finance, right? And uh, or, or a very sort of fertile ground uh, to grow uh, interest in those things. Yeah, great. I mean, okay, good. It's a good segue to probably, um, I know you did a lot of internship, but the one I want to touch on now is actually your stint in UBS. And mm-hmm. you were an expert, so-called, I mean, focus on the Russian equity. So rather than your view, maybe... Can you give us a flavor or what was the world's views on Russian equity at that time? I'm, I'm pretty sure there were some interesting views. Oh, you... no, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Because don't, when, I, um, when I started, uh, sort of I've come back from Japan to, 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 to Russia, mm. I've, uh, I've been incredibly excited about Russian equities. No, but not just me, the world, right? Mm-hmm. So came out with the BRICS acronym a couple of years prior to that. Correct. And it seemed every fund house has had the BRIC fund. Every house probably had some kind of a Russian fund, right? We, R- Russia traded at a premium in terms of like, to the emerging markets and to peers. We'd always run comparisons against Brazil because it's sort of, broadly speaking, quite similar, sort of large commodity sector. Brazil had faster population growth, but maybe Russia had a slightly more advanced uh, economic structure, kind of, sort of. Um, and for the longest time, from 2003 to 2006, Russia traded at a premium to Brazil, right? And then, um, not so much, right? And, uh, <laughs> so when I started, it was all sort of, uh, it was all super exciting. It, you know, all the inefficiencies of the market of the 90s were going away and it was becoming a normal market. And mm-hmm. then, their interest was uh, incredible, right? I mean, anywhere you went, because uh, we used to split up the world into geographies, right? And everyone yep. would use uh, different geographies. And wherever in the world you'd point your finger, you will find a fund or a relevant fund manager to deal with, right? So I had 
uh, guys based in uh, Peru, although they were uh, sort of outsourcing money to Madrid. And then there were guys in uh, Chile, but, uh, but they also sort of did it through London. But like wherever in the world you, you would point your finger to, there, there was interest in Russian equities, precisely because we're living through a, um, a bull uh, market in energy. Uh, mm -hmm. We're living market and commodities, mostly driven mm -hmm. by the China opening up in 2001, like the WTO joining and opening up. Yeah. And the Russian restructuring and opening up was also very significant in itself. So domestic stories were also uh, very popular because you, you did have a population that was, um, it was, it wasn't an emerging market, it was a transitional economy, but also an emerging market. So mm. it, uh, French coming together, Soviet institutions and organizations becoming more market driven, like mm -hmm. the, bank, uh, the country's biggest bank is now the best bank, right? And that transition from being an inefficient institution to this modern tech driven platform, uh, I mean, it took 25 years, but it's quite exciting for the investors, right? Um, but at the same time, you have things like modern retail formats, your uh, supermarkets, hypermarkets, none of it existed prior to 2001. It was, and it was, was nascent then, right? When you were covering this. Yeah. Uh, exactly. But, we, but the trends were firmly in place. And you, and you know, that's the funnest part. When the trend's in place and everything is growing 100, 200% a year, you know, it's not going to last. But that sort of going from a little bit to a lot, that's the most exciting part, right? And, um, and again, like supermarkets, that's not the most exciting industry in the world, but that growth stage is, right? And uh, uh, and then wherever you look, right, uh, you look at machine building, you look at ship building, you look at uh, oil and gas, you look at oil gas um, services, uh, retail, everything grew like 25% a year at the very least, wow. right? Like, <laughs> and again, it's very hard not to be excited about something like that, right? And uh, was there fraud and uh, overpromotion of certain stories? Sure, but really it didn't matter because <laughs> in the backdrop of, of that sort of magnitude, it, it, everything worked and it was, uh, it was quite exciting. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great that you, you pointed out. This is something I, I, I've got two questions that I want to branch into. One is, what do you think gave rise to brick simultaneously? Was it because uh, it was the theme of the day. Everyone saw it as uh, the mature markets, the developed markets like Europe had less opportunity and they were looking at this as an emerging, but what was the catalyst that it developed simultaneously? Was it because of certain government policies or it was just because of Russia uh, opening up more towards capitalism as compared to socialism in the past? Or what, what, what was the combination of factors, do you think? Well, as usual, there are two things right one is purely um fundamental mm -hmm. is what you're saying right yes we, we, actually it was a period of time when we had an overlap of a number of very, of very big trends china opening up and gobbling up all the commodities yeah uh, russia opening up and getting its act together right obviously early years of putin were actually very good uh, for russia mm -hmm. Um, and c cleaning up uh, the mafia and making the state safe, all that sort of thing, right? Yeah. All the while, you have continued growth in India, maybe a couple of decades behind China, but nevertheless, the trend was very positive, switching away from communism towards more of a market-driven kind of market-inspired <laughs> economy, right? <laughs> Capitalism. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And in Brazil, obviously, it's a perpetual uh, emerging market story. It's been emerging since the 60s, so it's very easy to attach it to any kind of uh, trend, right? And I love Brazil. It's great. It's fabulous. But let's be honest, the first uh, emerging market uh, boom has happened there, what, in the 50s or something? Yeah. Obviously, I wasn't there, but uh, apparently, it was also very exciting. And, and, and the drivers were largely similar. Um, and you also think about India and China having all these people needing all this infrastructure, needing all these commodities, where are they going to come from, right? Mm. Uh, and they're going to come from Russia and Brazil, right? So mm -hmm. that kind of makes sense. Uh, but I, I feel like the thing that really made it happen was the, on the promotional side was uh, Goldman Sachs's uh, head of emerging markets at the time, I want to say, but I can't really remember, uh, Jim O'Neill, right? Mm -hmm. Came out. Mm -hmm. Saying, um, look, 
describing all those macro trends and saying, look, for the next 10 years, you need Brazil and, uh, and Russia for the commodities and India and China for the population growth and for the broader societal development. Mm-hmm. Um, and the trends are strong that even in Brazil and Russia, you're likely to get those trends. Well, also India and China are also going to develop some commodities. It's going to be one great uh, play, right? And he coined the phrase, the, the acronym, right? He, yeah. He, 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 um, and it took off. It took off like wildfire, right? And, correct. correct. <laughs> um, why? Because it made sense. But, uh, you know, should you be lumping Brazil and Russia with India and China? Eh, maybe not. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but we did, and it worked, and everybody was really happy at the time. Yeah, and every many, um, quite a number of fund managers actually made money because of this team. Now, why I'm trying to draw parallels was mm. the ESG team that we have mm. right now. And I'm gonna we're gonna talk about it later when we go deeper and deeper because uh, I want to get your thoughts on 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 the team and and the everlasting sustainability of it. Because as we go sure. deeper and I'm I'm gonna ask you about uh, the realities of uh, energy economics and see whether this team is something that you know is this it's a story that just, just lasted 10 years like the brick story, you know, kind of thing. Well, I'm a big a believer that acronyms always fail, right? I mean, whatever the acronym of the day, it will in the end be disproven because acronyms are rigid, right? And you're mm. trying to capture an essence of, of a trend, right? And uh, uh, which me- means at the end of the move, it'll collapse, right? But it doesn't happen because it didn't work originally, but rather because the themes evolve and even if they exist to begin with, right? Mm. Uh, so on the BRICS front, it kind of made sense, which is why it took off so quickly and so well. Mm. And I feel like with ESG, the world was also crying out, maybe it's a stronger term, but the world was clearly noticing that uh, on the pollution side in particular, there are things going on, right? Mm. Uh, and there, w- there had to have been a pushback uh, against it of some sort. And in the end, instead of practical pollution measures, we got ESG. I don't know why, but here we are, right? Um, and also, it's quite funny because the name is great. It's environment, social, governance. Who doesn't love environment, social issues, and governance, right? They're all great, except governance is terrible. Um, so, so social issues aren't really uh, looked after here. In fact, made quite w- worse, especially now, right? And then um, on the environment side, again, I. I, I I think about uh, the real uh, threats to the environment, the, the paramount threats to the environment, which we seem to be neglecting and instead favoring things like wood burning in Europe. And you're like, uh, well, is this really the environment? Uh, because again, um, it's not to say the impetus is good, right? I mean, all these things, corporate governance should absolutely be at the forefront of every investor's mind, right? It's yep. very important because that's how you lose money. If the company doesn't care about corporate governance, they will screw you eventually. Maybe not on a trade basis, but eventually, right? Yeah. And the social aspects of things. If there is not the uh, prosper- participation in the prosperity of a country, right, it cannot last for very long. And you end up with situations such as Russia right now, right, with rich people fleeing it uh, and, well, the, the remainder not, not really enjoying life, let's be honest. Um, and then on the environment side, we all like to live long, happy, healthy lives. We all want our environment to be clean, right? Uh, but that means we need to be very uh, focused on doing exactly that and not running away with ideological uh, commitments rather than oh. practical uh, solutions. Yeah. You know? I, I love that last statement, rather than ideological commitments, it must, more must be practical. Great. Um, I'm going to segue into... Of all equity sector, I mean, you you did Russian equities, um, but somehow or rather you choose to specialize in commodities. Is there a particular reason, or was it just the go of the flow? Or I mean, based on what I understand, you you you, you pick commodities as a specialization. Yeah. yeah so I, I did. What, um, yeah. Well, a because that's where most of the IPOs were at the time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it was very exciting, right? And I remember working on this um, at the time, a landmark IPO for uh, Ural Kali, the uh, potash producer. Mm-hmm. It's listed in London. It's been delisted and merged, and is now state-controlled, uh, kind of. Um, but 
in 2007 when we listed it, it was incredibly exciting. It was, I can't remember, 100 times oversubscribed, something like that. Wow. It, was, it, it, was, it was crazy, right? I mean, people would be calling us and asking for allocations like you wouldn't believe, right? If you wanted to make a friend at the time, you give him some of your alkali shares, right? <laughs> And uh, because, again, we're going through a similar thing to right now where people were uh, perceiving there being a shortage of fertilizer, right? So fertilizer prices were through the roof and uh, especially in uh, potash uh, at the time, but actually it applies to a lot more of the commodities now. But at the time, um, the average time it took to put a new mine online was approaching 12 years. It's wow. Now because potash mines are really complicated, right? I mean, you can do um, surface extraction when you, like in Israel or in Australia, right? If you have a, uh, like a salty plain, you can kind of extract water from there. But uh, normally these salts are underground. So you have to dig a very deep tunnel and you have to really monitor the water table mm. because if it's those salts, they dissolve, right? And then you had the mine, and you now just have a cave, right? And uh, uh, water cave for that. <laughs> yeah, salty water, water cave. cave. Yeah. So um, not ideal. Um, so doing a potash mine takes a while, and uh, we went uh, on the trip uh, down the mines, right? I mean, that was quite interesting. And once you start doing stuff like that, you go, hmm, this is really good. And this is really interesting. I wonder what else is happening in this space. And then you go to a coal mine, and then you go to a diamond mine, and then you kind of, you know, you, uh, you see things here and there. And uh, you also think about the real world applications, and especially in the oil and gas space, right? You know, what it's there for. And for me, uh, a wake up uh, call was the winter of 2007, 2008, um, because there was a standoff between Russia and Ukraine again. And um, at the time, the accusation was that Ukraine was stealing Russian gas. Uh, but Russia was saying, no, it's not stealing Russian gas, it's stealing European gas, uh, a gas that we've sent into Europe and they should deliver into Europe. And since Ukraine is not paying for their gas, uh, you know, we're just going to cut it off. Right. Um, and seeing all, you know, all these people worried about freezing in winter and uh, there not being enough gas to heat homes. Right. And you think about it. Wow. What we do is actually really important, making sure that all this kicks along and, you know, um, that oil and gas companies have enough money to drill and develop. And you can't just have one supply. Right. You have to have security of supply, not because there is a good guy or a bad guy situation, but just redundancies must be built into the system exactly. and uh, and just as it was becoming more apparent to me it seems like the world was turning away from the idea and instead uh, the, 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 away from redundancy towards over-reliance right I don't know why but nevertheless this was the uh, path they chose to trod and uh, even in, and, and you'll note that what we're having now is not too dissimilar to that. I mean, obviously much worse because of the violence and the war, but conceptually the arguments remain, right? Uh, Russia is the only supplier. Is it reliable enough? Um, intermediate nations and what they can do to, to, to sort of to intervene in that supply lines, right? I mean, all these things are, are, are still questions we haven't resolved in Europe. And yeah. I'm not the rest of the world who also made their own mistakes right and all of it is layering and layering and layering and it was even apparent back then that to resolve it you need a lot more investment um and then immediately in 2009 we got it you know with china going into overdrive on spending but what happens if you have a hungry industry and too much money you have an yeah. efficient spending, right yes. uh, and and that's a fun ride of its own. But uh, what it also means is then you have a big withdrawal, which is what we had uh, in the mid 2000s. That's and, right. Yeah, sitting there in 2007, 8, I, I, I kind of obviously you can't predict all the cycles, right? I mean, no, nobody is uh, that smart. But to, to me, this uh, cyclical relationship became very apparent and very personal. And I really thought um, that. This is this is what I want my career to be a part of, right? I mean, working on these cycles, helping people make money out of these cycles, and also making money myself, right? I yeah. Mean, <laughs> of course, you have to feed yourself first, man, Leo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We yeah. all yeah. muck in the morning, right? And yes, of course, yes. Yeah. So it's interesting that you had that 
uh, sense of adventure that you know you were going on these field visits and all that. And and I think I like the point that you brought up about the real world implications because you did PPE, right? I'm guessing you went to Oxford to do to PPE. No, no, right? no. I went I went to St Andrews. I did financial economics. Ah, okay. But at the same time, what I wanted to uh, extract out was that looking at how these uh, mine commodities actually have an impact to real world economics, real world uh, crises, for the lack of a better word, that mm -hmm. could actually impact uh, how people live their lives, how people actually spend in inflation and all that. That actually got, in a way, I, that's how I summed up how you got hooked into commodities. Uh, yeah. And, and right. the, the other thing that I want to ask with related to this is that because it's so cyclical in nature, um, every time if you do get a wrong or a right call, let's say we, we, we evaluate the right call first, do you think that you, you had it right because you had more insights, more data points? And then the places where you got it wrong was because you missed out one variable. Is it really just by data or is it really just a, a gut feel that you've built because you've been on the ground so much and the data does not correlate. Because I read one very interesting piece, two data sets can, mm -hmm. can diverge into two different opinions, right? Yep. How did you how did you know how to filter out which one was the anomaly and which one was the more uh what a plausible one actually? That's actually that's a phenomenal question, John. Um, I think uh, getting something right or wrong for the right or the wrong reasons, if you if you if you know what I mean, yeah. Because uh, you can be right for the wrong reasons. You can just yes. be right. The thing that uh, you've uh, predicted didn't happen, right? Yeah. The price went up, but uh, you know the, the drivers you thought were going to do it weren't, weren't the ones. And you have to be very honest with yourself about uh, the if, about how you formulate your position, because to me. A commodities investor should always have a couple of things in place. One, an overall worldview, right? Mm, and mm. it is that of uh, expanding um, uh, money, money supply, but not too quickly. If it's a worldview of low and falling interest rates, if mm. it's a world of uh, uh, quick technological change and uh, people's uh, belief in that technological change, well, then your hurdle rate for commodity investment should be very high because mm. in this world you're not going to have the tailwinds to propel you forward and that should always be at the very top of the box right and uh, you have to understand what environment it is that you're working in does it mean that you're not going to make money in commodities no there are always opportunities but understanding that and understanding what the broader macro environment does to your uh positioning you, you know you, you always have to have to keep that in mind and you can say this applies to every investor but i think in commodities it's particularly pronounced because because of the cyclicality of it because if you see that you're doing counter cyclical investing right i mean you have to understand that this means depressed returns on average right and that's right <laughs> And th that in turn means that you can still have 10 baggers in exploration, right? Finding oil uh, or finding a copper mine or something like that uh, will always yield very high returns, right? These exploration plays are high risk, high return, and they're not super cyclical. They're not super correlated. But of course, mm. in the environment of higher uh, commodity prices, the value of those finds are that much higher, right? And it, they're that much more enticing, etc. Right? So um, the in in that framework, right? You always say, well, the macro is favorable or not, right? What about industry specifically, right? What about energy? What about uh, metals? What about uh, ags, right? Where yeah. do we stand? Right? And if you say it's positive, positive, and what about my company? Well, the management change is really good now. The capital report turn program is really strong. So it's all really positive. Therefore, I'm positive. And then you end up with a bad result. <laughs> like, the stock, and you're like, well, what happened there? Right? And uh, you have to really understand what did not hold of your assumptions. If, you, if your assumptions were all correct, you should have made money. You didn't. What happened? Right? And, well, I overlooked this thing. Well, actually, I overlooked a great economic crisis in the world and everything uh, down. And unfortunately, nobody made money. Mm, fair enough. Um, that's one thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but really, being very honest about the validity of your assumptions is what makes or breaks a commodity investor. Because you will note, especially on Twitter, right, there is an awful lot of 
very opinionated people from oil <laughs> to oil is going to a thousand dollars right you can correct, find correct. <laughs> whatever it is that you like you can find right and you can in, in, indulge in an echo chamber of your choosing right i mean yeah. you can go into the you know there's never going to be any more fossil fuels done or like we're, we're all going to be driving electric cars any of these fantastical beasts right i mean yeah. plenty of uh, channels for that as well as the, the uber bulls of oil right i mean you know oil is going to two three five hundred <laughs> one thousand right um and then if you get overly involved with any one of the sides you're likely to miss because the world is never you know left or right you know, this it's yeah. changing. There's so many variables. Even the your your constants, in a way, mm -hmm. can, be, can be a variable tomorrow. You see, correct. And I'm very bullish over the next decade. I'm sure yeah. that yeah. Uh, you know the community space is going to do phenomenally well over the next decade. Mm. But that doesn't mean that it starts tomorrow and it never stops for ten years, right? I mean, that's not <laughs> how these things go, right? Um, I uh, so I think just as uh, on a very conceptual. Uh, stage every commodity investor should have a very firm world view mm. that should manifest in testable uh predictions mm. so just saying look it's all going to shit or we're all going to have a great life that's not workable <laughs> yeah. it, it doesn't mean anything right it, it, you know like every month or every at least quarter right you, you shouldn't have well my world view tells me this over the past quarter this should have happened did it if it did fantastic high fives all around we go on if it didn't, okay, what happened, all right? And uh, the more involved you are in the market, the more regular these checks should be, right? And uh, some people who trade for a living, they do these checks every day, every hour, right? I mean, are my trades working? Is this uh, the right direction that I'm heading in? But of course, most people don't and most people shouldn't, right? And uh, um, the more of a step back you take from the daily market operations, the more of a long-term long view you can afford to have. Right. And if you do, um, even if you have a very long view, you hear all these people right running around saying Kathy Wood is right over 10 years horizon, you know, we'll, we'll make money. Great. It's, it's a view to have. I respect it. I wish them all the very best. But guys, like, if that's your view, what does it mean for today? What does it mean for next month, a year after? And if these things aren't coming true, A, should you have been invested now? Mm. And and B, if they're not coming true, do you want to change any of your assumptions now, right? And I do the same, right? I mean, I first turned bullish oil in late 2019. And uh, you know how that turned out, right? I mean, and uh, uh, I looked at a negative oil price in May 2020. And then I go. <laughs> and I'm looking around and thinking, huh, how did we get here, right? And of course, we know. It's, you know, a Bank of China got stuffed with a long position they couldn't close and roll at the right time. But it doesn't really matter. The point is, if you're bullish oil, this shouldn't happen, right? Yeah. But you turn around and say, sure, but we've had a pandemic and lockdowns and all yeah. these things. Fine. We did, but it's also a fact of life. And now we have to adjust. So what does this mean to me? Well, it means that my 2019 call becomes a late 21 call, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden we just introduce a two-year lag but it's which is easy to say but in practice when you're you know, when you're managing money or if you're running a position you know it means you were wrong you had to close it out go somewhere else and come back in two years right i mean uh even if the fundamentals haven't really changed the same arguments that i made in 2019 apply today mm. in fact but life means that we had, you know, for two years it didn't quite work. And 21 was right, but, uh, you know, the, the sharp move up in oil only happened in late 21, early 22, right? And throughout 2022. Um, all the, and, you know, people say that, uh, you know, Ukraine, Russia situation obviously uh, poured gasoline on that particular fire, but it's not just that, right? I mean, uh, the, the long-term consequences of poor energy policy would have come to fruition at some point, but yeah. time is crucial. And if it's not working, you have to step back and ask why, right? And to me, that has been the most expensive of lessons, right? I mean, how is it possible that me, thinking about all these things coming to one uh, outcome, and then life, uh, unfolding completely differently. 
And uh, thankfully, I learned it many years ago, right? That, that no matter how smart you are, no matter how correct you are, it doesn't mean you're going to make money, right? I mean, it's only if you get it right and on the right sort of timeline. That's that's when it works, right? Yeah. Unless the patients to really sit all the way through, which, you know, most people don't. Yeah. And and the, the, the struggle of patients all the way through is that um, permanent capital is something of a rare, rare scenarios these days. A lot of people, you know, with uh, the change of uh, rising interest rates, you know, it, we, we were flush. I mean, talk about just two years ago, people were so hooked on cheap credit and all that. And now mm. with a combination of, you know, tightening of credit, a uh, combination of uh, realizing energy, uh, energy deficiencies and all that, I think all these variables plus you had COVID. I, I, I actually did, didn't even realize two years has passed. To be honest, you know, mm. I mean, it, it's just like 2019 and then 2022. Yeah. <laughs> In between exactly. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Um, same. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very good point about permanent capital because yes. that's actually one of the advantages of being a retail investor over being an institutional investor is that you can treat your capital as being somewhat permanent, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it mean that uh, you should do stupid things? No, but um, nevertheless, courage of convictions yep. that you can invest in a long-term position in whatever industry or trade that you like, if you're happy to sit through all the drawdowns, and if you know that it's coming back because of reasons A, B, and C, fabulous. But I can tell everyone is that a professional money manager does not have that luxury, right? That's exactly. <laughs> you are to a, a trade or a position or a theme. Um, if it's not working, people will ask questions. And then why is it not working? And sometimes you can explain it the way easily. And sometimes, you know, the question of position sizing becomes more important than anything else. But that core problem of having to work to other people's timelines um, actually puts an awful lot of pressure on uh, any money manager, right? And this is where I think a lot of the retail guys have a slight advantage because they can work to their own timeline if they're disciplined, right? Yes. The struggle is that, the, the, like, spot on, the discipline and also the know-how and also the conviction because mm. these things are not built overnight. Uh, these things take, uh, uh, it takes discipline, it takes hard work to actually build conviction because a lot of uh, the conviction is built through your own work. Mm. You you can't you can you can copy someone else's idea, but the conviction of sticking it through it has to be built from an internal um, uh, compass or a clock. I, I I don't know whether you agree yep. with me on that. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and also that conviction, uh, some people, the more they're wrong, the more convicted they get. The stubborn people. <laughs> okay. Some people get. Their, their conviction wanes if it doesn't work, right? Mm. And the question is always like, what is the right approach? Should you give up and move on? Or should you wait it out until it works? And uh, again, I think that this is a very tricky question that everyone has to answer for themselves because can you sit through an 80, 90, 95% drawdown? Um, some people can, some people can't, right? Mm. Some people uh, really suffer. Some others actually revel in this and then go and tell war stories about how I was in it until the very bottom and then it went all the way back up. Now, from the point of view of optimal capital allocation, of course, being in anything for an 80 plus percent down is insane, right? Yeah, uh, crazy. You should have gotten out a long time ago, right? But then um, that only really applies, and again, in the professional money management environment because. Um, it, it, it is obvious to, 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 to you that, you know, if you like something and it's going down quickly, you get out, you wait for it to go all the way down and then jump back in if you still believe the story, right? That, all right, that's correct. Yeah. Way of doing it. But of course, behavior comes into this and people's uh, inability to um, force themselves to get back in quite often, right? So uh, as, as a behavioral fix, not doing anything quite often actually works all right. But again, it's more a question of understanding yourself than it is understanding the market, right? Yes. It's understand what works for you and build around that, right? And I feel like in that box system, that understanding yourself is a very core central part because it's not really related to the market in any way except to yourself, right? Yeah. And it kind of works as a bit of a prism for everything else. Correct, correct. So I'm going to segue now into um, the oil value chain. And um, 
why I wanted uh, this this question to be uh, to be answered was that um, some of the audience may not be familiar with the entire value chain. Obviously, they've heard of uh, what is upstream, what is midstream, what is downstream. But maybe if you could like uh, explain, maybe let's say to a fifteen year old, um, who are the players <laughs> within the industry? Obviously, you've got the IOC. So start from there. And then move mm. your way down, and I don't want you to stop at just the refineries. You know, I want you to to go a little bit further to the guys like Trafigura, the guys like mm. Vitol, the guys like oil tanking. Because even guys uh, who I know in the exploration space uh, that work with colleagues of mine don't even know this mm. because they were never involved at the fifty thousand feet, the commercial level. You see, so sure. probably you can take us through that, and uh, you know, uh, with the with the audience in mind of how do they understand the oil and gas value chain? Sure. Um... I think before we get into that, I would start with understanding why we need oil, right? Why we need gas. Uh, you don't buy oil and you know swim in it or whatever, right? I mean, or or or, or put it in a vase in the middle of a room, right? I mean, you buy oil because you want to do something with it, right? So demand for oil is derived entirely derived from demand for other products, right? Yeah. And those products can be pharmaceuticals, transportation, uh, paint, plastics. Plastics, you name it, right? Uh, yep. it, you know, um, which is why quite often people talk of demand for oil, and whether it's elastic or inelastic, it's actually demand for various subsectors, and it varies quite dramatically be between them. So, for example, demand for petroleum is it elastic or inelastic? Well, it depends, right? Do you drive more to do more work to get more money in a downturn, or do you drive less to spend less money? And again, it's circumstance dependent, it's person dependent, it's location dependent, right? Because mm -hmm. in some places you have public transport, in some places you don't, and things like that, right? Or for example, plastics. Do you buy more plastics or less in an economic downturn? You buy less stuff, but then cheaper goods tend to use more plastic, and p cheaper goods tend to be packaged in more plastic. So, Precisely. <laughs> So it it's like all all it's it's not a one way street none of it is right and if it were easy right i mean uh, the people would be getting it right <laughs> and <as> a, <laughs> all of us would be billionaires <laughs> exactly as yeah. a general you will note that everyone who's making predictions on the oil market regularly, like the OPEC or the EIA, they all, all tend to get it wrong, and revisions, even just reporting data, they tend to get wrong, right? So, like, uh, the, the, and then they do revisions every month, and you'll see that they're actually not insignificant, especially this year for some reason. Um, nevertheless, so understanding that, uh, that this is a very complex system where the end product is well, there isn't one, right? It's a very diverse set of things, right? From services to goods, right? Um, you understand that it's a very, it has to be a very complex chain along the way. So where does it start? Well, it starts on the ground, right? It starts with exploration companies, companies that go out and look for places where you can potentially find oil, right? Uh, you, you go and you scout and you do seismic studies and you figure out, well, this, this is a great location to drill a wildcat well to see if maybe there is some oil in there right you drill the well you've discovered the uh, fantastic high fives all around and you start making oil well f you start pumping it from the ground at that point you become an exploration and production company right uh, uh, and you start selling into the um, global market uh, the bigger you get as a production company uh, the more likely you are to have um, different locations where you drill for oil, right? Uh, you might start in Africa somewhere, in the Middle East, in Asia, in America, in Latin America. And as you get bigger and bigger, you become international. So the first set of big players are the international oil companies, who are literally just that. They are companies that do business in more than one uh, geographical location. At this stage, most large oil companies are international oil companies. But when we say or international IOCs, international oil companies, we tend to mean what is known as the majors, right? The really large uh, producers in the sector. So your Chevrons, Exxons, Shells, BPs, Totals. Totals, yes. And Total Energies, whatever they're called, right? Um, these are largely private companies uh, with very big presence in every aspect of the value chain, right? They, uh, produce their own oil, they sell their own oil, they transport their own oil, they refine their own oil. Um, actually, I say their own, they don't always refine their own oil, but they are participants in, in, in the value chain. Uh, and, and, they, and they do every action on, on the chain, right? Um, 
sometimes uh, when you are a, mm, an, a successful producer, your government may decide to say that, look, uh, it's all very good and well, but oil is just too strategically important and you are now government owned. And um, that's how you get uh, national oil companies, the NOCs, uh, the fully governmentally owned producers that are also participants in the global marketplace. The uh, biggest players in the space are, in fact, national oil companies like Saudi Aramco, uh, although it is now part listed, 5% of its shares are now listed in Riyadh, um, they are nevertheless a uh, state-owned enterprise. A lot of Chinese companies, your Sinox, your Sinopex, your PetroChinas, they're all state-owned enterprises and therefore qualified to be uh, an, a national oil company, like Libyan uh, oil companies uh, nationally owned. Uh, this is actually a surprisingly common uh, way of structuring Petronas, right? I mean, yeah, Petronas. Uh, this is a great example, right? I mean, uh, Petromina, right, as well. Uh, it's quite a common uh, PTC to a degree, right? I mean, it's, yes. uh, uh, it, it's quite a common way of structuring this outside of North America, right? I mean, uh, really outside of Britain and America, everybody else has thought of uh, the idea of having a national oil company. And if you think of things like ENI or Total, the kind of are national oil companies too, although they're not strictly speaking that, but there is clearly a special relationship between government and the company. They're very right. important for the local economy. And even if they're publicly owned, nevertheless, they are kind of sort of maybe a uh, national oil company. Okay. Uh, but that's just to set the stage that the production of oil and gas is basically um, controlled by three types of players. The it, pure independence, uh, like small companies who are maximizing their own profit when uh, drilling for oil. Mm -hmm. uh, international oil companies who may have slightly uh, more challenging uh, targets in mind, as in they have to think about uh, investor returns, they have to think about meeting social guidelines, they have to meet government obligations, they have to meet uh, the obligations within different parts of the value chain. Um, some of them treated uh, like separate businesses, like in America in particular, you yeah. frequently uh, sort of run into companies that just don't think of other parts of their international group as being in the same value chain. Whereas if you look at Russian companies, they very much do, right? So mm -hmm. a, like a, a upstream uh, asset of a Russian company quite often thinks of the ways of how they can improve services to the midstream section, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. This is not common, uh, yeah. and, but it nevertheless happens, right? And mm. um, because they are more regional groups rather than product groups. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and you have a regional head who is the head of the entire thing, like on every level regionally, right? Whereas, of course, uh, globally, it's more common to have a head of refining and a head of production and a head of yeah. transportation. Correct, correct. And, these groups often compete for uh, uh, power within the organization and uh, therefore it's quite common to sell oil to third parties and buy it back for refining from other third parties, right? Mm. It, it, it's, it's just what these big companies do. But nevertheless, as you get bigger, your motivations get a little bit more complex. And as mm. you get really big, Saudi Aramco, well, then your motivations are determined for you by your government, right? And the government can tell you, look, we need lots of oil or the other way around. In fact, no matter what you think about your production capacity, this is the number that we want from you and not drop more, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and mm, which is quite important because, again, thinking about price signals and how it encourages people on the production side, um, well, it doesn't if the government tells them not to, right? It doesn't really matter what the price is. If somebody who is your superior uh, tells you, you know, no more, you don't produce anymore, right? And uh, that's, just, again, just a, a fact of life, especially right now. Correct. Um, and so once you produce the oil, what happens to it? Well, you have to transport it, right? Yep. That that part is the midstream section. In America, in Canada, it's quite common to use pipelines. Right. Correct. I mean, because they have very Russia as well. Right, there are big pipeline networks around the world, uh, which is a great way of shipping oil. It's safe. It's secure. It's fast. Uh, it's fantastic. But you have to build the pipelines, which has become more problematic lately. Um, yeah. It means that 
new markets tend not to have them, right? I mean, mm. they've been around for a while to build a pipeline, right? Yes. So the really fast growing markets, they tend to not have them. And therefore, uh, they you mostly use uh, very root carriers, the big ships to ship it there. Cities. Yeah, or, cities. Yes. Or, or rail, right? I mean, yeah. if, if a uh, line exists. Of course, all of it is inferior to pipelines, but you know, you've got to do it what gets you the job done. <laughs> yeah. So, just a just just a a, a question uh, to elaborate more on the midstream. So, it's very common, and it's starting to seem uh, I'm starting to see that commonalities here as well. That the IOCs used to have to build their own midstream infrastructure. Yeah. More and more now, they're spinning off. Like for example, Kinder Morgan, which was an ex Exxon mm -hmm. midstream, right? Yeah. What are your thoughts on having it as an independent organization and the IOCs and the NOCs just focus on exploration? Or do you think they get synergies by you know having that scale and all that kind of from, from your point of perspective and maybe your observation of history? Um I think um the question very much centers around security, right? Uh, do you need that access to that pipeline, or can you trust a third party to be that access for your pipeline? So, mm -hmm. if you remember how Rockefeller uh, sort of squeezed out a bunch of his competitors, was by <laughs> refusing access uh, to shipping, right? I mean, if your competitors rely on your controlled company for access to shipping their barrels, they're not going to ship very many barrels, right? And uh, <laughs> by the time they realize that, it's too late, right? Because building an alternative it's too costly and it takes too long, right? And um, for coming from that mindset, of course, it makes sense for every international uh, major to own its own infrastructure. But as markets get more mature, as markets get a lot more um, trustworthy and uh, focusing on common goals quite often, right, industry organizations and things like that, mm. it becomes clear that having a pipeline network uh, in place is maybe more beneficial to everybody than just having your own personal lines, right? Because right. having a pipeline network you can purchase from third parties, you can sell to third parties. You don't always, you're no longer locked into just your own production volumes, right? If, even managing your refineries and your um, and your uh, production yeah. assets. Correct. Uh, so all of a sudden, you can then fine tune your refining for your end product, not your inputs, right? So mm -hmm. you optimize your refinery for exactly the sort of food you produce, but rather you can buy the blend of crudes that you need to produce whatever it is that the market is demanding uh, on the other end, right? right. If, if the also, there is a question of efficiency, right? Is it efficient for a large uh, com multinational company to build pipelines? And the answer is not obvious, but at first, it kind of is because if you spin out just the pipes business, it's going to be a much smaller business, probably has a higher cost of capital to them, right? Mm. So maybe it's not so efficient. But once you have specialists in the area, once you have the big uh, pipeline networks, actually their cost of capital isn't too dissimilar from the cost of capital to a large uh, producer. And then depending on the tax statement and depending on various, and then, you know, uh, uh, Legal structures like MLPs in America, right? Mm. Uh, Master Limited Partnerships too. I think. I think yeah. Kinomi got is a MLP. Yeah. M that's right. Yeah. Uh, you can actually make it work, right? I mean, it becomes quite an attractive proposition, and uh, so in 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 a, in a situation where you have confidence in the legal network, a legal system, and the mm. pipeline network, the quality of work, and all the stuff, it makes perfect sense to spin these things out. I see. Don't, um, maybe not, right? And yeah, I think this eventual state for almost every pipeline network in the world will be uh, spun out, right? And the specialists in pipeline building and management will be running it, but right. you don't get there overnight, right? You, yeah. you start building your own and then integrating it with everybody else. Yeah, that's a good point. So now moving more downstream, so... Um, I think US is probably a, a great example is because you've got a lot of producers in the north and even in the shale, you've got the mm -hmm. north, but all your refineries are down south, down in Oklahoma, down in, in New Orleans. Um, in Texas. Yeah. In Texas. And so from there, how does it, uh, I, I'm just trying to relate to the audience. 
So if you've got the uh, the producers, you've got the guys who transport it, the midstream guys, mm -hmm. and then now you've got the refineries, and take take us from there onwards to to the guys who trade, you know, the refined products as well. Yeah, so you can think about it. Uh, yeah, the oil gets produced in in Texas in large amounts, but also in the north, right, in in Canada and places like that, and they end up in uh, coastal refineries, one way or the other. Uh, and from there, they have a decision on what to do with the oil that they just bought, right? As a refinery, well, well sorry, okay, refinery is a big word. What is a refinery? It's like a big boiler, right? Mm. You put the oil in, you heat it up, and uh, you separ separate the bits that come out, right? And uh, you decide how much of what product you want to end up with, right? And um, how do you do that? Well, you measure the demand. You see what uh, what the market wants. How often can you reset? Not very often. It's not easy converting refineries from one product to the other. So once you made a decision, you you know you'd better stick to it, right? Yeah. But uh, uh, once you do, you, you start. You, you basically need to make two decisions: what kind of inputs you want and what kind of outputs you you, you want to come out, right? Mm. Uh, and once you've made the decision, press play, buy all the oil that you can from the pipeline. Um, and sell it onto the boat uh, in the shape of a finished product. A boat or uh, truck, depending if you're selling domestically or internationally, right? Um, who sells you the oil, right? Well, this is the interesting part because um, um, the world's best known oil storage facility in Cushing, Oklahoma, right? It, yes. Who, well, all sorts of people do. And it's not even a question of who owns it, it's who operates it, who rents it, right? It's all sorts of traders, all sorts of people uh, figure out a way of buying oil, storing it for a while, and then figuring out a way to sell it to the refineries uh, at a higher price, either mm -hmm. because of breaking or uh, because of realizing some geographical quirk, right? Or, or, or just delivering the surface, right? Is a service, right? For example, if a particular kind of crude is quite scarce, refineries will pay premium for it, right? And if you can That's source right. it, bring it to them, they, they, they'll pay you a premium. Um, and those services are quite needed by the uh, industry. And not just the oil and gas industry, but the oil traders tend to have quite a bad reputation around the world, right? They come across as uh, people who extort profits and people who do deals with nasty governments and provide money for all sorts of nasty things. Uh, and sometimes it's true, right? I mean, some of these people have been colorful individuals that really did a lot of questionable things. But 99% of oil trading is actually really boring. It's uh, <laughs> basically delivering a service that your biggest customers need. It's figuring out what you can sell from where to whom and squeezing out the incremental... The, the, uh, the incremental arbitrage out of it. Even, is it even arbitrage? It, it might be just like a, a normal profit, right? That the, the, the market uh, permits you to make, right? On, yeah. On these. yeah. So trading has this... Um, has this uh, reputation for being, you know, bombastic and exciting and great. It, it sometimes is, right? I mean, sometimes you have to go to weird places and uh, figure out, do deals. And every every trader's got a story about he went to Russia, <laughs> Middle Africa, and did a deal with this nasty gentleman, and you know, made lots of money as a result. And it, you know, yeah, sure, there, there is that. But uh, that's not the utility of the industry. The utility of the industry is keeping the oil flowing the right way in the right amounts and in the right yeah. places. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to just uh, further dive a little bit deeper for the benefit of the audience, is like most people assume that whatever oil is produced, there is actually the oil and gas exploration guys will actually f market their own product to the refineries. And the reason uh, why you actually have traders is that that doesn't necessarily happen. There yeah. must be a middleman. Yeah, that's exactly. A lot of people make this assumption because it's like Shell drills or Total drills, and then there's a refinery that Total operates or Shell operates, and they're just using their own. That is not necessarily the case. Sometimes it may, and that's why you know what you were saying is that think of the Trafigras, the Glencores, the Vitals as the matchmakers to match all this. You know. Uh, did I did I sum it up in a way that's simple enough? Yeah, perfectly. Because also, not all traders are trafigures and vitals, right? I mean, yeah. there are small is local traders. Because if you think about it, geologically, oil tends to 
become concentrated. So if you're dr if you and I go and drill in the north of Canada, right, we're going to come up with some very viscous, very sort of high sulfur Correct. oil. Right? Heavy oil. Heavy oil. But not just us. Everyone who's drilling around us is likely to have exactly the same oil, right? Mm. Whereas everyone drilling in the Middle East is likely to have a different kind of oil, like lighter, sweeter. Um, but again, everyone drilling around there is likely to have that very same type of oil. Which one's better? Well, better is the wrong question to ask. Which one right. need it? Right? Yes, exactly. So, like the the lighter, sweeter stuff is better for gasoline making, right? The heavier crude better for maybe more complicated refining, right? And again, better is maybe again not the right word, but you need both for a uh, for the way that our economy currently functions. Yes, the traders. And this is, I think, their main job in, 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 in the system, is to match up all the production of all the ver various sort of uh, types of oil around the world with the various refining processes around the world, right? And they have to do so reliably so that the refinery, like what we were talking about earlier, if yeah. I'm a refiner and I need to make a decision on what products that I'll be making, I need to make sure that the inputs Correct. are reliably made available to me, right? That's right, that's right. To put my trust into you as a trader, as a source of supply, right? So it's nice when you can build a mega refinery like in China, right? Uh, and be a hub of all the oil uh, that is be, uh, being sort of shipped into China and be made available to you, right? Then you can mix and match and great, right? But that's not always possible, right? And then. Uh, um, and then you have to figure it out, and traders come in and help you figure it out. Because, of course, yes. for refiners, building a buying team globally, which would be the alternative, right? Mm. Uh, have uh, all the people, which they do, by the way. Shell does market a lot of their own products. Correct, correct, correct. But, but a lot of that marketing does go to third parties sometimes when the bid is good enough, right? So if a Glencore knows a better way of selling Shell oil than Shell does, uh, well, what Shell going to do? Shell sell to Glencore, and then Glencore does with it whatever it uh, sees fit to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it. I think it's um, <laughs> when you were saying that, I was like thinking of um, movies. Uh, the perception what people get about traders is they have this dramatized movies mm -hmm. of how you know <laughs> you can yeah. You, yeah barons or drug lords and all that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. I'm gonna move on to um, a question of, and I think you did allude to this earlier. The role of NOC, IOC versus the independents, because um, I read a very interesting book. I, I think you may have uh, come across it or may have even read it. It's called The Fractus. And mm -hmm. it was actually talking about the how independent shell shale companies actually came together, uh, not, not collaboratively or independently, and they actually created the shale industry in, in US without, you know, Obviously, there was some inter government intervention and all that, but it was kind of like because this independence, uh, this independence actually re reignited uh, and made US to be uh, a, a big producer again instead of you know the, uh, the the Middle East of this. And my struggle is that the opinion I see is that independents are more, uh, what do you call it, more. Um, risk risk taking comparatively mm -hmm. to the majors and i would like you to either challenge my thought or whether to agree with it because what i got the impression from this this book called the frackers was that without the independence the shell oil industry wouldn't have exist the, only then the majors came in and i i saw that as like the, they were late to the game uh it was because of these smaller companies that it was like wildcatters and and, and is that is that your opinion is that your view or is it well, different? a couple of things. Uh, one, Trackers is a good book. Um, it's quite fun. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think it portrays a particular view of the industry. Uh, mm. Not necessarily just you got to remember that this is a particular take on what happened. Correct, right? it, correct, correct. It, it, it's one way of looking at the events that transpired. I will point out a couple of things. One, fracking wasn't new, right? Fracking mm. started in the 1940s, right? And, yeah. Uh, um, by 1980s, if you remember the Beverly Hillbillies, uh, the yes. Team America, they were frackers, right? And uh, the um, uh, it, 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 fracking in the Soviet Union dates back to like mid 
fifties, right? They even <laughs> used they even used uh, micro nuclear blast to frack for oil just to see if that works. So, like the idea of exploding uh, the shale to push out the oil is not in itself new, but Correct. as you iterate and as you figure it out, um, you uh, become better at it, and yep. at some point it becomes worthwhile. Yep. So it can happen in two ways. One, the price of oil is high enough, in which case uh, you don't even need the technological advancement to just continue doing what you're doing. Yep. And number two is that you get so efficient that the uh, production uh, cost drops sufficiently. Yep. But it turns out there is a number three. If money is made available to you in large quantities, then mm. you don't really care about the underlying economics too much because you think you'll get there eventually, right? Mm. So uh, this is kind of what happened in, in the mid 2000s and early mid 2000s, where uh, you had a, a uh, demand growth in the oil space like nobody's expected. All the while, you have this peak oil theory being branded mm. about. Correct. Correct. Um, and on that sort of backdrop, you can see how investors and policymakers alike would go like, huh, not only do we need more oil, we also happen to have less oil underneath us. So what can we do about it? And then somebody comes around and says, look, there's all this oil trapped in this, in this rock. Let's drill through it. Let's perforate it and get it out. Yeah. Um, originally, you're like, well, can you get oil out like this? And you go, yes, yes, I can. Gas and oil. And uh, originally, of course, uh, the cost doesn't matter. The, in the environment where you only care about security of supply, of right. course, if you put all the money into it to get it done, right? Uh, and you start with gas because gas is easier to get out, but then also oil, and then oil overtakes gas because it's more profitable, right? I mean, all, 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 all of that. Um, and uh, it's very important to understand fracking is actually... Uh, a relative of conventional drilling, but it's yes. not, right? Yes. Uh, fracking is much more of an engineering project than Correct. it is. Because, um, like, conceptually, if you think about like conventional drilling, you really need to figure out the reservoir, where it is, how to poke it, how to get stuff out, right? Uh, with the fracking, you're dealing with a massive shale, right? The Geological risks exist, and there's obviously tiers one, two, and whatever separation you want to imply, but uh, sort of license area to license area, the geological risk is less, and there's much yes. more continuity on a sort of per kilometer basis. Kind correct, of thing. correct. So it becomes more of an engineering project th than it is a uh, um, geological exploration sort of uh, project. If you, if, you, if you like conceptualizing it, right? So once you figure it out where, if you improve your operations sufficiently, you can, what I'm saying is, as with any other engineering operation, you can actually ramp up production and improve quality and cost control to the degree that you have phenomenal uh, cuts in costs of production, right? Yep. So this is what happened to shale and also to uh, oil sands in Canada, right? I mean, mm. through iteration, you've come up with a... Uh, uh, process that yields the best results. I mean, best for now. Maybe a couple of years down the line, we'll figure something else out and, you know, it becomes better still. But without getting too technical here, you know, like everyone who's really into fracking will tell you, no, 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 this is all wrong. You actually, you really need to figure out everything. You need to figure out every little detail and uh, you, you need to direct the drill all the way through and it's really difficult and you really need to understand. Uh, the, but those are just the mechanics. Those are just the mechanics, actually. It, it's very difficult. It's a very complicated process, right? Yeah. I mean, no, that it's not. What yeah. I'm saying is, like, conceptually, it is quite different, right? I mean, the nature of the process has killed it, right? And yeah. uh, I mean, this is an, an important distinction because fracking lends itself to scale very nicely, right? Yeah. Yes. So that's the key. And so when you go to your investors in 2010 and you say, "Look, the oil price is 100 bucks," right? We're fracking this stuff. Our cost is probably what, like, seventy, mm. but we can drive it up to fifty easy, right? It'll be forty in no time, and then maybe even thirty, right? I mean, look, it scales, it's efficient, it's quick to start up, and yep. geological risks are low. If you yep. package the 
together, it becomes a very attractive uh, value proposition to a decision maker, right? Yeah. I mean, the prices are high, uh, oil the oil's not going away, right? I mean, all these things. It, it, it makes fracking very attractive. And then this is how you start funding exploration through debt, because mm. like, if you think of debt funding for conventional exploration makes very little sense, because why would you take on the risk, right? <laughs> exploration, uh, like to get paid 10%, and you take 100% of the risk, right? It's, 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 I mean, sure, if you're into it, but uh, for a rational allocate, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, but for a, um, not to say that people shouldn't offer, by all means, offer it up and maybe, you know, maybe it's your cup of tea. But, uh, uh, but uh, as a general rule, conventional exploration historically has been funded through equity. Equity capital comes in, takes the risk, and then reaps the rewards when successful. Yes. Uh, uh, with uh, fracking, because you take away that massive geological risk and you right. bring in minor geology. I mean, there is still a chance it goes wrong, yes. and there's optimization and uh, all the stuff, and you might not optimize it exactly the right way. Nevertheless, uh, because you take away the exploration side of things, it uh, all of a sudden became a very easy trade to make for your private equity and. Uh, uh, and even uh, debt investors. Debt, debt equity, yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. Um, and so you end up with this massive glut of capital in, in, in the industry. And in any, like we make fun of Kathy Wood and uh, uh, the investments that she's made. But uh, oil and gas investors of 2014 weren't much different, right? I oh, mean, yes. These things that uh, were funded shouldn't have been funded. Um, and... Uh, the other problem that nobody really accounted for that at some point all this glut of uh, expansion capital yielded expansion right so production grew and production grew very rapidly and uh, in the middle of 2000s america was producing what 4 million 4.4 million barrels a day yeah. now it's producing uh, 12 and a bit roughly maybe according to ia probably like 11 something but yeah. never mind yeah uh, you 3x your production domestically, right, of one particular kind of oil, right? The shale yes. oil doesn't be quite right as a general rule, right? Um, how can how, how can this not have repercussions for the entire global uh, economy, right? All of a sudden. I see. And uh, this kind of what happens uh, when you let uh, your strategic resource management be outsourced to the market, because the, the way the market manages things is the trial and error. You try yes. this, you try then you slowly figure out what the balancing act is. And that process of adjustment is quite painful and quite yeah. uh, difficult. And this is exactly what happened with the fracking crews, because by the time they all started producing and producing efficiently, the oil prices just collapsed. Yeah. And then because of the, all the incremental volumes they've put out. And, right. then on top of it, and then on top of it, the Saudis have looked at it and they realized that all of a sudden, OPEC has stopped being the swing producer. And OPEC's power was the swing production because they were the guys who determined what was the balance uh, in the system, right? And all of a sudden, it's the Americans who are doing it, and that's not the position that Saudis wanted to tolerate. They felt threatened. Of course, as you as, as you would be. And uh, the what they would point towards was, of course, uh, the cost of production. And so in 2015, they've uh, you know decided to market and say, you know what, we don't care. Yeah. I mean, uh, is eight bucks, yours is 80, right? I mean, yes. you do the most, right? And uh, now, of course, those cost differentials no, no longer are nearly as bad. I think the Dallas, Dallas Fed puts out a very nice uh, set of numbers on cost estimates. Again, mm. I have a lot of people uh, in my network who tell me that they are wrong and off base. <laughs> even so, even if they are, they're consistent in what they're doing. And so, given you come up with these numbers, right? And uh, the, these costs are in the um, these costs are in their uh, high forties right now, right? Depending on where, and maybe in some other places. This is yeah, but like it's I, an aggregated number again. You see, I mean, it's like hmm. different different field. What people don't realize is, I mean, I think more to benefit the audience again. Um, people don't realize whatever you see, uh, it could be even a, what is quoted is actually a futures price or it's actually a mm. spot price. And the the differences in between the quality and the grade of crude vary so differently. I mean, Ural lights, Tapis mm. lights, right? And all this. And 
with relation to what you just uh, explained about having equity uh, finance versus having debt finance uh, with the mm -hmm. risk profile, I think what I wanted to understand uh, or on your opinion is this. Do you think that it's best to let market forces decide what is a healthy balance in between the independence versus the international majors? And if that's the case, um, do you think that the role of IOCs and NOCs will diminish because you have more independence coming in, capital rewards them if they're efficient? Or do you think that whatever status quo it is uh, it is in today with IOCs and NOCs being like 80, 90%, it's, it's going to be this status quo for, for, for the foreseeable future? Well, John, thank you very much for bringing it up because actually something I wanted to address earlier as well, but uh, kind of my mind wandered. Yeah. Is, uh, important uh, input in all of this is mineral rights right and um, in america and in uh, other parts of the world but most importantly in america yes. as a land you own 100 percent of the mineral rights that are directly underneath your property correct the concession right? because it's concession rather than state owned right yeah um so you as an individual can decide how many people how many companies can produce on your land. Are you going to sell it all to one? Or if you have a lot of land, right? Because you right. Only can split it. If you yep. only have a small piece, who you can sell it to? Or, no, not even sell it to, you sell the rights to the minerals uh, in your... Uh, in your backyard. <laughs> in your backyard, <laughs> yes. For a um, regular payment, right? You get mm. a for the sales price and, and some upfront uh, money, right? Mm. Uh, this lends itself very nicely to small operators, right? Yes. And, Historically, in America, you had a lot of small operators, conventional and unconventional, right? Correct. Uh, because in this environment, it's quite easy to figure out, well, there's probably a place where you can put a well that makes, I don't know, 15 barrels a day, something like that, right? I mean, like a, an old style. Uh, yeah, a donkey, a uh, nodding donkey. Nodding donkey, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, y you know, uh, does it make sense? It makes no difference for the IOC, right? How many of these does it need to make? It doesn't even move the needle. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't even notice the needle, right? It yeah. doesn't get the needle. Whereas, of course, if you are a two-person operation, you know, like between you and I, if we get two or three of these things together, right? I mean, approaching 100 barrels a day, or all of a sudden, you know, it pays for the gasoline for the truck, right? And yeah, maybe for yeah. some place, right? And you can start building out, like, you know, a bit of a thing. Um, in America, it's possible. Almost nowhere else in the world is it possible, right? Mm, all right. Therefore, um, like in Russia, you don't own mineral rights. You just don't, right? Yeah. I mean, mineral rights are owned by the state. Um, in Saudi, that's not even a relevant question because, <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to... Uh, so, with this in mind, uh, or in, in China, for example, right? Again, fully state-owned, right? Yeah. So, in, in those areas, you're just not going to have the independent uh, oil companies, right? So a very interesting phenomenon has been over the years has been the creation of small global exploration companies, right? I mean, so these guys that go to places like Equatorial Guinea or Guyana, right, and uh, or Namibia or wherever it is, like I consult for a company that's doing some work in Grenada, right, in the Caribbean, for example, right? I mean, uh, you go to these uh, places that are not produces yet and yep. do not have uh, maybe a robust legal system and uh, with regards to petroleum regulation in place you help them with regulations you help them with uh importing best rules right i mean you help them guide them along the process of setting up um, everything really for the framework the infrastructure because yeah because they don't know, they don't have the know-how <laughs> exactly and yeah. also so it makes like, uh, you know, maybe in the 50s and the 60s, people would come in and would try and swindle the governments one way or the other. But with the Internet, information being so readily available, it's so much easier to work together with the government to adopt the best practices, right? From right, the rest right. Of the because they're made available. If you go there and say, look, you have to give us tax-free everything for no reason, they'll turn around and say, no, this is not how this works. Look, yeah, exactly. Case and see so if you go to them and you're not being entirely forthcoming with what you want to do and why you want to do it and why you need the concessions on their end they're not going to give them to you right and yeah, so yeah. this um, uh, process uh, is quite interesting but also uh, it 
enables smaller operations uh, with fewer people to go global, to go and explore for hydrocarbons around the world, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes less so. But um, it, it gives rise to this new, well, not new, but uh, this... Um, undersized group of companies that you wouldn't think would be participants in this global market, but are. Because you can now outsource almost every other aspect of development, right? You can get a geological group to do all the geological work. Right. You, can, right. you, can, you can hire supercomputers to do interpretation of your seismic. You don't need to buy your own. You can uh, hire literally every part of the equipment. You can even get a project manager to manage it all for you, right? All right. So, all right. So, the core requirement for these companies of core personnel and core uh, equipment is very low now, right? So all of a sudden, all you need is a couple of guys with some money and uh, with with an idea, right? And uh, you can go and carry it out. Which you know, you know, when you were saying that, you know what I, I thought of, uh, Leo? It's like there's now the gig economy for the oil and gas industry. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, it's, it's a it's a bunch of freelancers who have technical expertise and all that. And also to allude to your point as well, and to, to make it more concrete, is that if this reserves were so small, the mm. oil majors wouldn't even want to look at it. And here you have, because the startup cost is low, you're actually helping the country because there's capital, there's not just in terms of money, but in terms of you know resources, manpower, and coming in Correct. and you know developing this, right? But it's not just the size of the resource, it's also the riskiness of it. Yeah, right? of course. Because of course. Um, large companies don't like dry wells, right? Nobody does, right? Yeah. I mean, but fish companies in particular, right? I mean, they risk weight a bunch of their drilling, right? So um, when you are a small company and you have this one project, you do everything you can to get that well drilled, right? Correct. If you are a multinational, well, is this this well you want to be drilling? Because you also have 15 other projects, some of them continuous exploration, some of them greenfield, some of them brownfield, and uh, you, all, you risk weight all of them and new fields because in um, exploration geology you ha you're very unlikely to be given a very high rating right if you if it's a greenfield site until you drill the well no matter what the 3d the looks seismic like, whatever tells you until you hit that well you, you're not going to go so the risk penalties are very high right so just the way numbers work right it makes much if you are committed to this one project your risk ranking is all of a sudden 100%. You don't care. Correct. You're going to, right? Yeah. Whereas, of course, uh, so that's, that's the opportunity for the smaller operators because they can be committed to that one area and be committed to that one well and get it done, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're going to be successful, but it, it is much more likely that you will get it done, right? Which yeah. is why smaller companies exist, which is why these smaller operators exist, right? And uh, they had, they, they flourished in the mid-2000s, right? Uh, and I mean, especially in the UK, there are a bunch of them listed, right? Yeah. Uh, they, they, it's been sort of rough going for them for the past 10 years, but it's coming back, right? And uh, I think it's a very important part of the market that uh, is quite exciting for an ordinary investor, because this is where you can actually make, uh, as, a part, as a part of a balanced portfolio, right? I mean, it yes. can actually be exciting high yielding uh, position right correct correct if um, done right yeah if done right exactly mm -hmm. exactly and, and and part of this podcast is to uh, you know to to help them build these mental models um i'm going to move on into a little bit more of a macro view um mm -hmm. supply demand mm -hmm. so you, i think it's always uh, you alluded to it earlier of um, eia getting forecasts uh, not accurate and all that and it's not it's not easy because uh, as you also pointed out earlier about uh, demand in elasticity, because there can be uh, certain times when multi variables at play. Like, like for example, you, I love the point that you made about cheaper products demand more plastics because of wrapping. You do not want to have like uh, your cost to to have proper boxes, proper containers for it. It's it's not yeah, gonna, <laughs> yeah right exactly yeah. yeah and and but here here is where a, a lot of people come in and try to predict. Uh, supply and demand and in in a way alluding to its prices of oil i think where i want to ask your opinion about is what are the parameters involved because um is one one on one side is demand the other side is supply but there's also this thing called um reserves that certain mm. countries actually want to keep and um for the benefit of the audience 
uh, there's this term called an SPR, which is a Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And this is actually something that OECD actually recommends. There's a certain, uh, there's a certain ratio. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can explain that as part of the equilibrium balance in, in you know, uh, setting oh. the price for oil. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, this is actually a very important point, you're right, because especially yeah. this year. Yeah. Um, Every uh, OECD suggests that all its members uh, have a certain amount of oil in reserve uh, to cover their import needs for at least, uh, I think uh, they're saying it's 30 days of imports. Uh, yes. Is the bare minimum. At the but, bare minimum, 30 days of imports. Yeah. Um, and most economies comply with that. So you will know that there is an awful lot of oil in reserve around the world. So uh, currently, I, I was looking at some very good date on this uh, not two days ago, and um, they, they were saying that uh, storage tanks, as on average, a storage tank is about 48, 50 percent full uh, mm. around, right? And it's fuller in some parts of the world than others. Mm. Uh, and if you think about how oil and gas industry developed, the security of supply is very important in it because if you build out a refinery and you stop sending gas into it, you need to shut it down, restarting it is problematic, right? Yes. Um, it has to be a continuous process. Yeah. So in order to guarantee that, you need to guarantee that you have uh, the products to put into it. Right? Correct. And then the same goes for, uh, if you even think about a local petrol station, right? How often does a petrol truck visit it to fill it up, right? Mm. Once a week, maybe, yep. right? Yeah, uh, uh, depends, depends on where you are, depends on how busy, but roughly, right? And uh, so you need to have storage there for the week's worth of filling up, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, same idea around the world, right? Uh, whatever the part of the industry, you need to have a little bit in excess so that in case there is any kind of interruption along the way, you can cover it from the reserves. And yeah. the more that you do, and actually happens surprisingly frequently, right? Minor interruptions happen every day, because yeah. think about it, daily life, something always goes wrong, right? Yeah. right. Yeah. Um, same here, but uh, the, the consequences are a lot more important. So uh, I find uh, it quite funny when people say, well, uh, you know, we need to be more efficient with the supply, we don't need reserves. Yeah, I understand. It is much more financially efficient to not have reserves. I, I, no, I understand the argument, but I think it's wrong because it doesn't. The cost of it going wrong is not being calculated, right? And the benefit of of you having been able to cover in the environment where things have, would have otherwise gone wrong is not being captured by your model, right? Yeah. It's kind of the same as when people say that solar is super efficient. Right, because like it's super cheap to produce, right? And you have these really low kilowatt and hour numbers of just raw generation with solar. Whereas, mm. of course, what accounting for is land wastage and needing to build out spare capacity for what solar doesn't work and feeding yes. that to the grid and storing all the stuff. Right? Like once you account for literally everything that you need for solar to be a part of your system, the costs are not nearly as low as uh, are being quoted. But, you know, most people aren't very worried about it because, you know, you, you want the exciting picture on the front. Same, right. with, uh, same with not running petroleum reserves. Because the question is not that you will definitely need it for this particular reason. It's more mm. like you don't know what will go wrong and how, but mm. when it does, you know it will, you need to have something to fall back on. And yes. there is an made that maybe you don't need quite as much as uh, before or maybe there is an argument to be made that you need more than before because of the geopolitical tensions and uh, uh, I don't just mean the Russia thing I also mean the China thing the Iran thing right all of it has a potential and propensity to cause uh, disruptions in the oil supply right yeah. Uh, looking at what uh, Germany and uh, the rest of Europe had to go through filling up tanks this uh, in gas this year, you're like, all right, well, yeah, A, good thing they have tanks, because can you imagine uh, what would have happened if they not? Correct. And, B, and B, also, uh, yeah, right? I mean, physical supply is very important in this environment. So, 
Mm, yes. So the, the, to go back to, to, to your original question, yes, the uh, a functioning uh, system of petroleum reserves is very important, and they can come in two shapes: commercial reserves and uh, strategic reserves. Mm. Strategic they are specifically for the point when things go terribly wrong on a macro scale, right? Is right. it a hurricane, a war, is it geopolitical uncertainty, whatever, right? I mean, you release it into the system uh, to cover shortfalls driven by it. A pr a commercial reserves are uh, reserves that are being kept by market participants uh, to make sure that swift, normal operations uh, continue within the industry. Yeah. But and. Again, a lot of people have told me, look, you have to make very big distinctions. They are two very different things. And I agree, they're very different. But if you think that one is not fungible with the other, you're kind of mistaken. Because it's, it's the silo-based thinking. It, exactly. It, <laughs> yeah. it's a, exactly right. Silo-based thinking. Because yeah. what you really need is petroleum in storage, whether it's strategic or non-strategic. Like when push comes to shove, it doesn't matter. And yeah. uh, I feel like that's what uh, people need to kind of wake up to a little bit. Because there's... A, the, the amount of times I've seen people arguing, well, this is a strategic draw, but commercial gain. And you're like, well, yeah, sure. No, from accounting point of view, sure, it's, it's fun, exciting, etc. But what you really need to understand is the overall level of storage, right? I mean, that's the number you need to focus on because Correct. it will, uh, you know, the strategic reserve, sure, when it's plugged up and kept to one side, we take it out and we don't worry about it. An environment where it's a part of the system, well, we make it a part of the system and we'll look at uh, how much it's contrib contributing and for how long. And then also how much we'll be drawing back once uh, it's being refilled. Because I think it's quite clear to anyone to, who, who spends a day thinking about it, that in the environment where fossil fuels are a major part of our energy mix, which I believe they will be for a very long time, uh, life without a strategic reserve it's going to be the, hell. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be intermittent, which is exactly the problem with uh, the unreliable sources of energy, right? And that's right. That's right. That's right. No, I, I, the reason why I wanted to bring out the distinction was because it's related to the next question I'm about to ask you, which is function of OPEC and OPEC Plus. And, you know, mm. Joe Biden releasing 2 million of uh, strategic petroleum reserves. And I'm glad you brought up that the 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 insanity of trying to argue one is commercial reserves and strategic reserves because one of the reasons why he re released it was because of commercial reasons. I mean, mm -hmm. the Americans cannot stand they can't pay petrol prices at the pumps. That's and and yet here we are. If you're going to listen to saying that it's silo, that uh, strategic is strategic and commercial is commercial, I I don't think I don't think that works uh, in a way. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, I actually. Mm, I, I, I would say that uh, uh, I was very surprised when they started the releases because they started in 2001, if you remember, yes. right? Yes. The actually started before the Ukraine conflict, right? Correct. It was just surprising to me because I looked at it and I thought, why? Why, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, because the prices are high, but they're not. Historically speaking, oil prices aren't high. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can argue that they were actually able to build up uh, the reserves of the past uh, however many years. Uh, and you can argue that maybe the level of reserves is quite high because the mm -hmm. net levels are now quite low, right? American usage of oil is quite high, but domestic production is also high, right? So net imports um, aren't. So if you use net imports as a basis for that 30-day calculation, then you can say that, yeah, the SPR is quite high. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, Therefore, we can sell the excess. I would, for me, I think strategic petroleum reserve should not be calculated on net imports. I think it should always be calculated on usage because mm. the whole point of the strategic reserve is that you use it when everything goes, else goes to shit, right? And yes. in that environment, you assume that all imports and exports um, get borked and you stop the exports, in fact, because you need the uh, fuel domestically, and domestic production likely suffers. Now, why it happens, you know, you can make up uh, stories as to how, how you think you got there, but the, the whole point being that the strategic reserve is there for that exact eventuality, when you need it all to cover the entirety, well, not the entirety, because it's not, just not physically possible, as, as much as possible of your uh, domestic production needs. And uh, you assume that there is, the difficulties aren't just international, but also domestic on the production side. Yeah. Um, 
bad framework in mind. I, I always thought that the right level of reserves is in the, you know, Mm, four to five hundred million barrels, right? I mean, something like that. Uh, yeah. th that'll be like a minimum comfort level. And the, the more, the better, quite of frankly. Of course. Uh, mm, so releasing oil in the environment where prices aren't uh, skyrocketing, it's not like we're not talking $150, $200 a barrel, right? And even if they are spiking, like in February, you let it be, right? You let it trade for a while. Correct. You Correct. Know, it's just a spike. It's just a bleep. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a bit like painkillers, right? Don't administer yeah. it just the moment you feel a little bit of discomfort, right? Correct, I mean, correct, maybe. correct. Um, and uh, I, I actually, um, uh, there's a gentleman on Twitter called Rory Johnson. He, he runs the service called Commodity Complex, uh, which I would recommend people subscribe to. Uh, he actually made a very good point about how maybe if you're looking at it in a specific way in uh, April 2022, you may see that China uh, is opening up, right? Uh, and it, it is firing in all cylinders. You might have mm. another a couple of million incremental demand. From mm. uh, you have up to 3 million of production or export declines out of Russia. Um, you, you, you might go from a balanced market to a deeply uh, deficit market very quickly. Mm. And then that is where price spikes might be insane. And therefore, uh, reserves are needed to act. And I'm, I've grown more sympathetic to that view that if you're looking at it then and there, at that point in time, it might seem like the right time to announce a framework for SPR releases, which I think is maybe what should, they should have done. Instead, mm. they've announced this and continued with the releases. Yes, even exactly. Lockdowns, even though you know the economic situation obviously deteriorated around the world. Um, and so... I, what I would have said, yes, okay, fine. Maybe at the time of making a decision, it was the right or close enough to being right call. Um, you should have reversed it almost immediately as soon as China started lockdowns, right? Precisely. At that point, it would become abundantly clear that the ba balance actually is a lot more negative and uh, there is no point in releasing all this oil into the market because where does it go? It goes from the U.S. petroleum reserves into the Chinese petroleum reserve, right? I mean, and... Uh, Especially, right? I mean, in the environment of geological uh, geopolitical uncertainty, do you really want to be doing that? Right? Yeah, uh, you're you're feeding I mean, ammunition to your enemy in a way. <laughs> I mean, enemy enemy is a strong word, but if yeah. you know, if you look at the uh, geolo uh, ge geopolitical um, moves that the you know U.S. administrations have been making, they're clearly antagonizing China for one reason or another. And if you are pursuing that uh, strategy, why the hell are you giving them cheap oil, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> I mean, unlike you, they cannot produce all of the oil that they need. Although, again, like I think the quality and the um, experience in the Chinese uh, uh, oil and gas industry is something that I think maybe the West underestimates. But mm. uh, even so, um, you just look at the raw numbers and you see that they make about a quarter of the oil that they need. Why ship them the balance, right? I mean, at, at, at depressed prices. I just, I, I, I don't fully get it. And I think uh, they themselves also realize that they, 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 they might have done something uh, that might have been justified, right? I mean, I, I'll grant them that. Might have been uh, justified. But uh, I would say, um, whilst it might have been justified in April, by mm -hmm. May, it wasn't you right. You could have stopped it by then. Forty CP would should have been uh, very obvious and very immediate, right? Although yeah. I suppose, like any other painkiller, once you start, you know, you start taking them, and it, it seems great, and you don't want to feel any kind of pain, right? So uh, you continue, which is what, basically what they've done with. Uh, I, I think they've upgraded from painkillers to morphines, uh, uh, Leonid. Yeah, yeah <laughs> they, they, they got hooked on morphines now. <laughs> mm. And then. Yeah. Again, I don't want to get too political on all of this, but using um, strategic petroleum reserves uh, in, the, in the way of uh, lowering gasoline prices before elections, I mean, that's just another way of buying votes. And sure, I understand everybody does it and look at this party, that party. That's not the point I'm making. But I'm saying yeah. like, just net, net, it's not the right thing to do. All right. Yeah. And you should, yeah. Whichever party you are, whichever side of the aisle, it's, it's just, it's not right. And yeah. uh, Unless that's the mandate. Like, say, for example, you're in India, uh, where there is a clear mandate of providing cheap fuel for the people. Yeah. This is 
uh, you've been hired to do, brought in to do, then yes, fine, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that's what you do. But it, when that is not your mandate and you're managing something that is supposed to bring um, reassurances of supply in the real sort of fat tail events, right? Uh, yeah. Then, um, then maybe what you're doing is not right. You know? Correct, correct, correct. Um, I'm going to shift a gear into uh, long-term views of the industry. Mm. And it's uh, with regards to reserves replenishment. I mean, I'm pretty sure with your research and what I've uh, taken up, I, what I see has been the decline of capex over the past three years, even before COVID. Yep. And, you know, the reserves replenishment is not as quick as what it used to be. Um, why do you think it's the decline? Uh, is it because of uh, risk uh, tolerance has actually lowered? Uh, there's probably one. and the second thing is, is it is it because of ESG and also this, this strong push? You know, I, I would like to hear your thoughts mm. on that. Certainly, I think uh, a couple of things are happening. Do you remember mm. the peak oil thing that we touched upon? Yes, uh, exactly. Our, we're kind of living through almost the opposite because I feel like ESG is they're talking about peak oil demand, right? <laughs> uh, I think this will be also just proven much the same way, right? That uh, uh, we are looking for between 107 and 110 million barrels a day of oil uh, demand balance right. by 2030, right? So another 10% increase to 2030. And quite honestly, my personal estimate, I think we're going to go to one to five by end of 2040. Even even if everyone is saying that you're going to have more electric cars, more every, everything, which is, uh, yeah, there's going to be more electric cars, but conventional cars aren't going away, right? Yes. I think... Uh, a lot of people will understand that electric cars aren't the right solution for an awful lot of circumstances. Correct. I think it'll be a painful lesson because I also do metals, and I'll tell you the supply demand balance because of the electric cars there, uh, especially for rare earth metals, right? <laughs> but but even for the basics, right? It's not looking so good, right? And. Mm. Uh, um, so once all of this filters through, all right, then it will have to happen because as with all of these big flagship policies, you have to be hit in the face with reality before you yes, realize. Exactly. <laughs> I love the way you uh, say it. <laughs> and uh, this will happen in 20, uh, late 2020s, early 2030s. I don't know. It's very hard to say for sure. But um, once it does and you realize well, you know what actually hybrid vehicles are probably the solution right i mean um more be, again, uh, less give you the security that you can fill it up with gasoline in case you need to or drive around electrically in bigger cities right it gives you the best of both worlds um but again improve on the technology over time and you know get it better but then hybrids are also much more complicated than electric vehicles yes. which is why took off so much uh, easier because again uh, complexity wise it's uh, you know it's, it's much further down the pyramid right um once that happens i think the public the, the views of uh, supply and demand on, in, in oil will, will also change right uh, by the way that's not to say that we should continue polluting right quite the contrary we, we, we should clean up our act as much as we possibly can, which means uh, capturing and uh, using or storing as much of uh, various gases as we can, right? Um, methane, for example, for me is an awful problem that we absolutely must address, right? And yeah. we should on it because uh, that's a real uh, problem, right? I mean, a lot of... Uh, uh, in fact, uh, a lot of people forget just how much, how far we've come fighting pollution on, you know, on a daily level, right? I mean, like cars, for example, used to be massive polluters. Now, still polluters, especially on the CO2 level, but everything else we've kind of cleaned up, right? Uh, the and, uh, NOx and uh, SOx. Uh, Lops, yeah, and uh, uh, SOx, yes. Uh, silicon, yeah. The, 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 we've kind of cleaned that up mostly, right? Uh, all the... Mm, Modern cars, their efficiencies are just unthinkable for a person of the 80s, right? I mean, you can get like a 50, 55 mile a gallon uh, car in Europe quite easily now, right? Yes, I mean, yes, yes. And you've so, got catalytic converters, electronic injection, and all that. I mean, un if you talked about it probably like even 20 years ago, <laughs> mm, <laughs> fuel yeah. injection was, was nascent, you know, it's like yeah, you know, it's, it's carburetors. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> Uh, um, 
we've, we've gone an awful long way. And I, and I keep bringing this up with people. It's like, you think about it. Should you replace a car with an electric vehicle? Yes. All right. Well, what about if this car is actually really low emissions, a really low emissions vehicle? Conventional ICE engine, but low emissions. Still yes. All right. Well, what is that level at which it makes sense? What if it emits like a gram of carbon a year? Well, all of a sudden it becomes, you know, uh, a talking point because once you understand the cost of switching to electric vehicles, you also understand that the relative cost benefit is also determined by how, by how efficient the existing of cars are. And yes. sure, all the gas guzzlers from the 80s and the SUVs and whatnot, these things, not very efficient, uh, quite pollutive, right? But some of the more efficient vehicles, is it really worth replacing them with EVs? In yes. some cases, like in really dense urban areas, mm, yeah, okay, uh, granted. But most of the world isn't really dense urban areas. Precisely. Right? And, Precisely. Um, and in those environments, it makes no sense building out infrastructure for electric vehicles. Like uh, for my American friends, I keep saying like in Wyoming, right? I mean, does it make sense to build out uh, solar charging infrastructure all over the shop? Maybe yes, maybe no, but you can see the art. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's an awful lot of copper and it will take an awful lot of metals uh, to build it out. Yes. And there will be very few cars using it, right? Yes, and yes, if yes. I'm committed to doing it, sure. But you got to understand that... Uh, you got to understand that uh, maybe what you're doing is not in the best interest of you know the world as, as at large, and um, that, that to me is, is the key point, right? None of it is dogma, right? What, what I'm saying is, is not that I've made up my mind and here's what's going to happen and here's where we're going, right? Mm. All of it has to be a conversation. We all need to really sit down and assess. Well, what is of all these things we're doing, what are the actual impact? And the worst thing we can do is greenwash things, right? I mean, pretend yes. like they yes. have no goals, or like do things just to tick a box. Like all these things are terrible, and they're setting us all collectively back a lot more than we should. Like, what is the role of solar and wind power in the world? Because it's not zero. Like, uh, I do believe that in places it makes total sense to have wind turbines, to have solar panels, right? And we should make them as efficient as we possibly can. But what is the role of these things in the in energy system? Which yeah. again, I uh, my fascination with China in many ways, right? Um, also has to do with looking at what they're doing with their energy grid and mm. wanting to go right because honestly, that's by far in a way the most interesting grid uh, development plan that there is. And the fact that that's not enough. Uh, given the challenges that they've had in 2001 uh, and trying to keep... Uh, do you remember when they had the uh, supply interruptions in the summer? Yeah, yeah, yeah they were curbing, 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 curbing the factories and all the commercials. Curbing yes. exactly. And that grid will give every other grid in the world 10 years at least in terms of development. They are at the very forefront of what Correct. is possible. Correct. Uh, <laughs> and if what they're doing is not enough, well, it means that all of us, all of us here in, in Europe and in America, right? That they oh, even in Asia. <laughs> in, in Asia, for sure. Yeah, the investments we all need to all undertake to uh, get uh, our grid to be functioning in an environment where a lot of our power comes from wind and solar, well, that investment just got doubled or maybe doubled again, right? And um, with that in mind, we really need to focus on uh, practical solutions. Right, we look at wow. this and say, okay, in an ideal world, our farts don't smell. But here we are, right? I mean, what do we do? How do we best maximize what we have, right? Does it make sense uh, to be building out solar farms in the UK? Eh, maybe, but surely mm. it doesn't make quite as much sense as in Saudi Arabia, for example. Correct, right? correct, correct, um, correct. Does it make sense to build out wind? For sure it does. And like in the Shetland Islands have all the wind infrastructure you have and produce all the hydrogen you can because it makes sense, right? Yes. Um, and same goes for every place in the world. You have to have a conversation about what makes sense and you have to optimize for two things. You have to optimize for pollution, sure, and all the gases and all the things, right? But at the same time, you've got to remember that quality of life is the paramount thing, right? Because even if you listen to the environmentalist arguments, like, you know, you, you have to stop using oil because we're all going to die. Well, <laughs> we're 
not. Right? I mean, all of us, we will die eventually, but, uh, and you know, we will have a decent life until we do, uh, even if what they say comes true. Um, people are quite good at adapting to things. Yep. And uh, technologically speaking, people are excellent at inventing new things when they're put in a pressure point, right? I That's mean, right. We're, That's right. Uh, whilst this is also the other problem that, you know, this theory of you shouldn't launch interstellar spacecrafts until you invent a very good engine because it'll take too long. But then <laughs> you're not going to invent the engine until you have spacecrafts going places, right? And it's a catch-22, right? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of the same thing here. You're not going to invent the best of technology uh, in this space until you start using it, which is why it's good that you've uh, started at least on the solar and on the wind. But the solar and the wind you've started with are just not going to look good. And the failure to acknowledge that, I think, sets it back further behind in the future because I think it's fine to say, look, we've actually proven that we can harness solar and wind to power things, and it's fine. It's actually very good. Now, let's acknowledge that whilst that's true, it's also not the solution for all of our power needs. All right. That's a very important uh, place where we need to arrive to as a people, right? And once we do, then we can talk about the role of oil and gas in all of this, the role of nuclear, the role of new technology, right? I mean, uh, there's some very exciting geothermal plants out there, right? I don't know if they're feasible or not, but I've, you know, uh, there, there are some really, really ambitious geothermal plants to say that geothermal is going to be the energy of the future, right? Or maybe thorium reactors, whatever whatever the, uh, or maybe micro nuclear reactors, whatever the final solution is, we don't know. We just know that the solution will incorporate a bunch of uh, these uh, technologies, right? And one of them will be oil and gas. Oil and gas is going to stay here for my oh, life, very, very, yeah. I think, I, I think, even my children's generation, I still feel very strongly about that. Actually, to be oh, honest. for sure. Yeah. And that's not to say that, like, plastic pollution is terrible, right? We should do something about it and figure it out. But we mm -hmm. will. I have no yes. question that a we're better at it already, and then b eventually it will all get cleaned up, right? Um, and it should, and it should, you know, there should be tax incentives and all these things to 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 to, to um, enhance all that. So yeah. having. That was a sort of a lyrical uh, interlude, but um, bringing it back to where we are, I think uh, in this environment where you had ESG policies telling people, look, we're turning off oil in 10 years time, right? In this environment, how can you possibly invest in oil, right? I mean, if it takes you um, five to six years at the very quickest to develop a brand new greenfield site, right? Okay, you know, shale, sure, it's quicker, but not everything is shale, right? Correct. Uh, Offshore, it might take you up to 10, 12 years, right? Even some something super successful such as Guyana, right? I mean, that took uh, since 2008, it's what, 14 years in now, right? So, right. Um, and it's only now ramping up to, you know, significant production. So, we, we, like, how if you think that oil is gonna, not going to be used in 10 years' time, how do you sanction another Guyana, right? And then uh, you don't, is the answer, right? And uh, for a lot of investors who are under the ESG umbrella, uh, investing into oil and gas becomes very difficult, not just on the ideological side, but also practically speaking. Yeah. Uh, and so when you are a producer in this environment with existing production, whether you're a country like Saudi or whether you're a company such as uh, Pioneer or EOG or uh, Exxon, doesn't really matter, you see that what investors want from you is their money back, right? Yes. You need to show uh, capital discipline and you need to show capital returns to your investors. And in the case of Saudi, you realize that it's not the volumes that people are after, right? Uh, because if you ship them too much oil, uh, they just buy all your oil for free or for, for very little money, relatively speaking. For a song. <laughs> yeah. for, for, yes. And uh, mm, instead, what you should do is limit the supply into the market and maximize price, right? E e kind of like any other cash cow industry, right? If you, if you really like want to break it down to, to, to there, right? Uh, and it makes total sense that Saudis are saying, look, we're not going to invest in all this new output, at least not in the near term and not too much, right? Um, because you lot, you're, you're, you know, Europeans and Americans are telling us that you're not going to need oil in the future. Well, mm. in return, I'll sell you my oil for a lot more money now if you want to turn <laughs> 
fact, it's probably going to help you to make a decision to switch uh, away from oil where you can, because at low prices, the incentive might not be there, right? And uh, yeah. So I believe that we're firmly in the environment of elevated oil prices. I think we haven't even entered that properly. We've lived through repricing. We've returned to the mean. Well, it's not the mean, but like what I believe uh, normal uh, oil oh, prices. Fair, uh, okay, fair maybe a bit strong word, but uh, uh, practical prices. Pra okay. Practical, pr yeah. Um, the question is, where do we go from here? And I think that the end point along this route will be much higher like oil prices significantly multiples higher from here yeah. and yeah. again i don't want to go too crazy and like you know throw out these massive numbers and it's not going to be overnight and it's not a sort of linear path either right i mean there's yeah. an awful trilogy along the way but the settling price will be much higher uh, until and when we enable uh proper investment cycles in oil and gas i feel yes. like the way that esg is right now that's not going to happen for another five years at the very least so for the next five years we're going to have more and more pressure from the price side of things onto the um, esg tenants right and once they change them uh, because again idea of esg very very good implementation of esg not so good right so mm. eventually the market will figure it out and uh entice them sufficiently into changing some of the ideas into you know having a uh, solution in place that will indeed focus on the social on the governance and on actual practical aspects of the environment as well mm -hmm. and until that happens i feel like being in the oil and gas space is actually really lucrative because the companies are paying you uh, the investors paying you dividend um if you want to focus on the dividends uh if you want to focus on like uh, free cash flow yields or whatever right i mean all these numbers or returns on capital metric right all of it uh, is looking very good for the industry and, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a good segue to the next question i was about to ask you which is uh you did men uh i mean in your note uh to your investors uh, uh roe roce or roic whichever way you want to calculate it um you're seeing um and this, this actually caught my eye was uh you know even on cnoc dividend yields of almost 14 percent yeah and that's and, that's, and that's, that's very conservative man that's uh just yeah. going bare bones i actually think it's going to be more like 17 to 19 range <laughs> okay and um quite interestingly i mean um, you know you've um, we had the pleasure of uh, uh you know meeting physically uh Leonid, even though you are based in london and all thanks to aaron you know shout out to aaron mm -hmm. as well um yeah you also had the opportunity to meet uh, this, um, in a way, the A Asia version of uh, Operator, which is Hibiscus. So Hibiscus, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there, there, there are some um, contrary thoughts in the investing community about about um, oil and gas producers, and maybe give us a brief overview on you know why do you think they're such a lean and mean operator and do you think that that growth will actually come from uh, more acquisitions of assets like Repsol where, you know, there's like the cigar butt kind of asset value? Or do you think that they still have to go a little bit more into green uh, fields and upstream? What are your thoughts? Well, I, a couple of things. Uh, to, to answer your question, because before I wander off again. Uh, yes. They uh, I feel like Hibiscus A is a phenomenal operator, right? I mean, they have focus on efficiency. You can sense it in everything that they do, right? I mm -hmm. mean, from the top down, they're not flashy. They're focused on uh, making the most out of every dollar. And I mm -hmm. think in the environment um, that we've had up until this year, right, this is what enabled them to really take these cigar butts, which I would say that this is a maybe a started cigar. Uh, yeah. no, no, you know, somebody's had a good mid cigar, mid cigar, not cigar. Yeah, yeah. cigar. There's a, you know, a good healthy chunk left, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, they've taken it, dusted it all off, and uh, made it look really good, right? And uh, uh, again, the focus on execution is what really sets them apart. Mm. From my uh, and but you're right that there aren't that many cigar assets, uh, 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 cigar butt assets out there, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Even if you assume that maybe there's going to be a couple uh, more that they could participate in in Malaysia, right? And uh, maybe a couple more things they can bid for internationally. I do think that as with all these companies, uh, you do have to move into your own greenfield development and exploration. Mm. Right? Quite a footprint here in the UK in the North Sea, right? And, yes. Uh, 
uh, I'm actually personally I'm very interested to see how the projects go here. I, mm. I, I an awful lot that they can do. Um, I believe that overall, as a company, they can double, uh, more than double their mm. uh, daily output by 2025. This is what they've been telling investors, and I do not see why they would not be able to do this, right? Mm. Um, and as usual with these guys, you do have to build in uh, to your model a chance of a further discovery or a further acquisition of a project that will take you further still, right? Mm. And uh, uh, again, given their focus on efficiency and given their focus on uh, value for investors and for investors' cash, I do think that they're not going to overpay for any of this either. And yeah. when you have a money like that, you can sleep comfortably that they're not going to throw your money uh, to the wind, right? Yeah. Uh, my personal view, and again, not uh, you know, investment advice or anything like that. But <laughs> yes, I put a disclaimer at the beginning too. <laughs> but, yeah, yes, it's very important that you guys do your own research and talk yeah. to firms appropriate. But my personal view of um, Hibiscus Petroleum is that it is my uh, most preferred small player in uh, Asia. Right? I mean, I, I don't see anyone else of their size that uh, is is nearly as attractive, right? And uh, you look at the guys like Rex Petroleum, right? Nothing wrong with Rex, but, uh, you know, the challenges and issues that they had operationally in Oman, right? I mean, this is not the sort of thing that you're likely to encounter. Okay, right, I understand different uh, issues, different uh, things, Correct, but, right, right. Uh, but uh, Hibiscus is very focused in making sure uh, that uh, you just don't subject yourself to fluctuations of that nature, right? All right, all right. Uh, and also, um, Geographically speaking, right? Uh, now, of course, right? In the environment where you can get 17% dividend yield in CNOC, why would you not go on CNOC? You absolutely should, right? But any portfolio should, you know, you should uh, diversify it into more things, right? So I think um, that Impex, for example, is a great shout, right? For yes. uh, anyone who can do Japan, right? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't like Woodside's been a great play this year, right? But honestly, uh, if I had to come up with a lean focused uh, portfolio, Hibiscus would be a part of it because uh, because it's such an easy uh, portfolio company, right? I mean, yeah. no, and it's easy to under I mean, if you understand the mechanics of it, you understand what is uh, P two reserves, and you, you yeah. can roughly calculate. I mean, the efficiency is there and all that. Kind yeah, of thing. Uh, you know that they got the reserve base. You know yeah. that they got the skill. You know that they got the team. You know that they have the aspirations to double production. All the while, you know they're not going to go too crazy and overpay for anything in the right, program. Right. And it's a good thing they don't have. They're not flush, flush with capital right now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, but so they wouldn't go and overpay for stuff. And yeah. already they're early in their path. Already they're starting to pay a dividend, right? And yes. I feel like that is also important because you can always increase. As and when you're done with your d development programs and whatnot, right? So I think it's just it's a very easy sort of thing to hold, like peace of mind kind of equity, right? I mean, mm -hmm. in the space, you know yeah. that it's not going to be involved in any any crazy scandals. It's not going to be involved in any like trade wars or trade disputes. So like like Sinop, for example, what well, what is the problem with Sinop? Well, like if you're a U.S. investor, you can't buy it because yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because of sanctions, right? And you're like, what did they do? Well, they did nothing wrong. It's just they happen to have a shareholder who is related to the uh, central command of the um, Chinese army. And you're like, well, but like cross holdings among Chinese entities are very common. Well, yes, but, right? And uh, the Americans have decided to put the sanctions on, and uh, American investors cannot buy Sinoc. Well, all right, fine. Does it impact their operations? Not really, but it does impact their share price, right? And it well, did impact price for the longest time which enabled some of us to pick it up at uh you know at uh at a discount it is a significant discount right and if you bought it at you know the seven dollar rate range or something right i mean then your yield is not 17 percent then your yield is like like in the 20s right yeah and, uh, fine, great thank you right <laughs> and but that's exactly right that, that's the sort of thing that you may want in your portfolio and uh, i think hibiscus is a different take on it, right? I mean, it's not this big statement purchase. It's a very much a steady, high quality, focus on execution and buy and don't worry about it sort of play, right? If That's it right. goes, happy buying more because you know there is very little company specific that can go wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, not to say that nothing because 
things can always go wrong, but uh, in this industry, right, unfortunately. And when it does, it tends to be quite unpleasant. But uh, the risk with hibiscus is less with than most other players, I feel like. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Leo, I wish I could go on and on, you know, I, I think, uh, <laughs> but maybe um, as a last question and and then we probably a wrap up. Um, I think we've talked through the value chain. I think we've talked through the, um, some of the players involved and we've talked through about the economics uh, of reality, practical prices. I think maybe I would want to end this, this segment and definitely there's going to be more podcasts to come, but how should a layman actually look at energy demand going forward? And why I feel this question is as important as a wrap up is because I think a lot of us take energy for granted until a crisis hits. I mean, look at Germany, look at UK, mm. right? That is something that is like way out of left field, right? But how should uh, uh, policymakers, laymen, people, or even non-industry participants, how can they help in helping um, create an environment that has practical prices, as well as uh, you know, um, not come up with thematic themes that may be proven wrong in the future? What, what are your final thoughts on that? You know, um, well, I would. Remind people first and foremost. Well, actually, two very important things. I feel like mm. that I need. To Number one is remember that demand risks are manageable. Mm. Supply are quite unpleasant. Mm. Um, so, if, to illustrate the point, if you need to buy a little bit less of milk, well, you can use make do with less milk, right? Because of the prices. But if there is no milk to be had, that's quite unpleasant, right? <laughs> it, pronounced in the oil and gas space if the prices are very high uh, to heat your home you still probably will right or to cool your home you still probably will even if it does mean uh, discomfiture right and unfortunately yeah. you know we live in a world where we cannot guarantee comfort for everybody yes for otherwise um, but if there is no gas in the pipes and you can't heat your home because of the supply disruption now that's really problematic right and I would urge everybody to remember that that it is the disruptions to supply that really get you not the demand ones right mm. um and the other one point i would make is that always challenge your assumptions on that right on the demand side of the equation uh, and by what, by what I mean by that is what we talked about, about plastic use, right? That it actually goes up as pricing for, for, for goods goes up, right? Um, across the board, you will find pockets of uh, discontinuity. You'll mm. find these pockets of uh, data that just are counter to what your gut feeling would be, right? For example, mm. overall, as energy prices go up, you expect usage to go down, just naturally, right? But does energy have some given good characteristics, as in like usage goes up as prices go up, uh, because they, they, they spend more of their money on this, even if it's already a big chunk of their expenditure, because they can't afford not to kind of thing. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, that's, that, that's right. And uh, in a lot of these places, that's the case, right? Um, does it mean that blank, it's, it's a blanket given good? No, of course not, right? And <laughs> But you got to understand where you are in the cycle and where you are in your particular area. And uh, understanding that, try and take it and extrapolate internationally as well, right? And uh, um, there is an awful lot of fairly lazy analysis out there and to say that in the environment of a recession, oil prices might, might go to $40 or $50 or something like that. And I would just invite people to think about what happened in 2008. How did we go from like $120 oil to $40 oil, right, during the financial crisis? Usage only fell off by a million and a half barrels. And people are pointing, yeah. well, an incremental drop of one and a half million barrels of uh, uh, production has caused an $80 correction in the price. Yeah. You're like, no, guys, you're again forgetting about it. It's the supply. It's the supply is what matters in this yes. environment. Because what happened in 2008, everybody who could increased supply. Why? Because the targets for a national oil company, for example, might not be in the amount of barrels they put out, but rather in the amount of dollars it generates for the treasury, right? That's right. 
if the price is falling precipitously, right, you'd think the natural response is to stop producing to let the price recover. But no, immediately, because you need the money, you just pump out more to get more money. And this is exactly the response we see in 2001 and 2008 and in the 80s, right, where people would overproduce to meet those obligations. And actually, the same sort of cycle sort of started in U.S. shale in 2014, where mm. dropping prices also incentivized a lot more sales into the market because right. they needed to raise the cash, right? Yes. And this is why thinking about demand, never forget about supply, right? Here, we are all of a sudden, okay, well, the supply is constrained, but it doesn't matter because of the demand. No, it's, it's two sides of the same equation. Well, what is the problem with the supply? Not only do we have long-term constraints, we also don't have the commitment to increase supply. There is not the vicious cycle in the in market right now to the same degree that we've had it before. Why don't we have it? Well, because all the industry players are in a much better financial shape. That's right. Uh, OPEC participants are in a better financial shape. And the ones that aren't can't do anything about it, right? I mean, they've been trying to increase production for a very long time, uh, like Nigeria, for example, right? I mean, production there keeps dropping. They would like more oil revenues. They will not get it anytime soon, right? Um, you look at shale companies in pretty rude financial health overall, right? Uh, paying high dividends and servicing the debt, paying down debt quite dramatically. Canadian producers paying down a ton of debt. U.S. producers basically debt-free more or less, right? I mean, I was looking at it uh, a couple of months ago and uh, Chevron had, what, like $10 billion of debt on balance sheet and like a $400 billion company, that's no debt, right? I yeah, mean, there's nothing, it's a drop in the ocean, man. <laughs> yeah. So in this environment, what can possibly propel them to overproduce, right? Which is why don't forget about supply, because supply is the thing that gets you, right? Yeah, Dep exactly. Are, you know, what they are, right? And of course, you can always demand a little bit less as prices go up. Sure, that's natural. But if the supply response isn't there, if the negative feedback loop isn't in place, right, you're just not going to have the same volatility in, in, in oil to the downside than you might elsewhere. Uh, and sure, financial participants expect it, and that in itself is grounds enough for it to go up and down. Mm. But you look at, but you look at the follow through in the real world, and when you don't see it, when you see that OPEC is happy to cut by 2 million barrels and maybe another 2 million barrels a day, right? Uh, in this and maybe another five, right? Who knows? If they're telling you, look, we're going to cut until the price stops dropping, in this right. environment, the recession might actually be worse because of the energy non-response. But this linearity of a relationship between economic activity and oil demand might not exist to the same degree that people think it exists. Yes. And Yes. Which is why I think it's important for, to get their heads around it. It's important for people to bring it around to their own behavior, right? It's like, are you not going to be using oil and gas in the near future? Are you going to drive less? Some people for sure would. Some people actually would drive more to go to more jobs, to do more things in this gig economy of ours, right? And uh, uh, always try and con contextualize your own behavior within yeah. the broad framework of what other people may or may not be doing and always be data dependent. Because I'll tell you, if uh, in three months' time we we'll look at the price of 40 bucks, and it turns out that Saudi and UAE and Kuwait they will open the floodgates and they will play <laughs> with oil, I'll be the first one to say, "Look, I was wrong." Right? Yeah. I mean, evidently we're focused on something else, and this is what happened. Do I think that is likely? Personally, no. Uh, no. And, Same here. But, but that's what I mean by saying open-minded and data-dependent. Be aware of what's going on. And thankfully, right, there are times when you need to be very, very specific. You need to understand the sources of demand, the strength, like the regional uh, allocations and whatnot, right? Um, for a seasoned oil and gas investor, that comes fairly naturally, but for the layman, it might not, right? Right now, you don't even have to go that far, right? Yeah. Right now, the real question you have to answer is, is there going to be more supply uh, in the near future, dramatically more supply in the near future, and how far the demand is going to drop off. That is a very top-level question, very high-level question that you need to figure out. And if you figure it out the right way, you will make an awful lot of money in the space. Yeah, exactly. Leonid, Leonid it's been an abs <coughs> absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward to uh, the second one where we Probably could talk about metals. Probably could talk about even soy, uh, you know, oil seeds. Palm oil, yeah, yeah, palm oil, man. I mean, uh, it's something that I think uh, it's close to a lot of Malaysian hearts uh, because you know, uh, 
I've told you before, I have a very personal relationship with the space, and I'm uh, I'm happy to talk about it uh, next time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it's an absolute pleasure, Leonid. Thank you so much. Where can people reach you, Leonid? Um, well, I would welcome everybody to go to lmresearch.co um, and register for updates. And uh, my Twitter is at Leo Miranov. Um, welcome to reach out there. I'm not genuinely very public with the stuff I do because I have the group of clients that I kind of yeah, cater to and I like to keep it that way. Yeah. But if anyone is interested or has a you know question I'm I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, uh more than happy to uh, engage uh, Great. Genuine. Yeah uh, I'll leave the links in the show notes you know uh, uh for for your for your for your for people to do reach out uh for for provided you. areas or areas that you can share right <laughs> hey, can I say one more thing John that I yeah, think in this um, there are an awful lot of resources out there for individual investors right I mean you can actually go out and you can get commentary pretty high level commentary right. out there particularly on Twitter right so in, in energy space I think Twitter in particular is really strong yes. and there are a couple a couple of uh, accounts there that I would highly recommend people follow, like uh, my friend Tracy, uh, shy girl, right, and uh, Rory uh, from Commodity Quantum. Rory, yeah, I follow Rory actually. He's quite, he's quite good when he writes. There is um, and there is an awful lot of uh, uh, content that uh, people can get there, and I would highly recommend people seek out these people and build out their own um, uh, Network. little. Uh, a network on, on Twitter. Now, yeah, is it going to be unbiased? No. But going into it, you understand that this is just one source. Of yes. Exactly. Exactly. I think. I think, unless you're really lazy, I think uh, uh, you are uh, spoiled for choices for tons of information. I mean, in today's, I mean, even the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or even uh, CBOE, mm -hmm. they have even educational videos That's to right. tell you about. Cushing's of Oklahoma, the yeah. importance of prime networks, and you know, I mean, I mean, I I feel today there's no excuse for you to to seek out this uh, great point, uh, Leonid. You know, uh, before before seeking out for an expert advice, I think there's mm. many uh, exploratory kind of content to get you into that until you get a bit of mindset, and then further deeper explanation or further peeling of the onions. That's where you go look for the experts. You know. For sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learn it. Absolute pleasure. Thank you again. Um, and you, uh, looking forward to our next chat. See you. Likewise. Bye. Yeah.